Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, students, friends, foes, welcome on behalf of the Reconnect Consortium. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the last day of our last conference, the final Reconnect conference, which also marks the end of the four-year Reconnect project. I'm sure most of you know that this is the third day, meaning that we have had two earlier days, which took place online and which focused on rule of law on Tuesday, on democracy yesterday. And now for our final day, we can finally meet in person. It is such a delight to see you in person. Here in this, let's admit it, classy, Fondation Universitaire, a place with really a great history. You should watch around, look a little bit at those very, you know, decent portraits, all the things that you find here. It's a place with a lot of history, but also very symbolical for us because it's a place about academic cooperation. And that's what we have done as part of our Reconnect project. The first two days, as I said, were dedicated to discussing respectively rule of law and democracies, the two values that lie at the heart of this project. And today we even focus more on the interconnection and what those values mean for the future of the European Union. We do that in light, of course, of our research findings, but also from perspectives and observations from some of the very prominent speakers that we have in today's program, such as uh, Commissioner and Vice President of the Commission, Dubravka Switscha, the President of the General Court, uh, Mark van der Waude, who we very honored that he is with us in person today, Professor Daniel Thomas from Leiden University, and last but not least also, Honorary President of the European Council, Herman Count van Rompuy, to name just a few. For the last time, I shall briefly introduce the Reconnect project to you. I'm sure most of you are totally fed up with that brief summary, but simply to state what we have done in the past four years, <clears throat> Reconnect, the acronym stands for Reconciling Europe with its citizens through democracy and the rule of law, was, is still a four-year multidisciplinary Horizon 2020 research project, launched 1st of May 2018 in the Middle Ages. And over the past four years, we have brought together 18 partner institutions from 14 different countries. I had and have the honor, burden, duty, pleasure of being the overall coordinator of that project. And what did we aim to do? We aimed to understand and provide solutions to the challenges faced by the European Union with an explicit focus on strengthening the European Union's connections to its citizens through democracy and the rule of law. We also sought to build a new narrative for Europe, a new narrative for the future of European integration, enabling the EU hopefully to become better attuned to the expectations of its citizens. It's a great document and it will be presented to you today. Now, why is there that big disconnect between citizens and the European Union? Without going too much in the detail here, because that's a very broad question, let me again highlight that it has to do with especially a number of successive crises in the past couple of years in which the EU has not been able to convince citizens that it is able to offer efficient but also fair solutions. Remember, the financial crisis since 2008, the Eurozone sovereign debt crisis, the migration crisis, the Brexit uh, affair, COVID-19, and now, at the end of our project, the security crisis following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And then there has been all the backsliding in terms of rule of law and democratic backsliding in some of our member states that has been going on sometimes for more than 10 years in the meantime. And so in those past four years, we have taken a multidisciplinary, a multifaceted approach to those issues, analyzing the concepts of democracy and rule of law at the European Union level, at the member states level, also looking at it through multiple dimensions, three distinct units of analysis, as we say, principles, practices, 
and also perceptions of citizens. And we have shared our insights and recommendations that were distilled from our research results uh, in the past two days, and all of these things are in the meantime online. But that brings me to the essential question. How can the EU reconnect with its citizens? And our working hypothesis throughout the whole project has been that for this to happen, the Union must give proof that it is serious about upholding its own foundational values. If the Union cannot put in practice the values upon which it has been founded, including democracy, the rule of law, but also the other values listed in Article 2 of the EU Treaty, as you know, justice, human dignity, human rights, solidarity, pluralism, tolerance, tolerance non-discrimination, equality between women and men, and if the Union is not able to ensure that its member states respect those values, then we really have a serious problem. And this is why we have developed multiple policy and treaty change recommendations as well. And we have also spent, as I said, the last year in developing this new narrative for European integration with the aim of reconnecting European governance and citizens' preferences and delivering on their aspirations for justice and solidarity. Okay, so you already know that there are these two big documents which we're going to present to you today. One that consolidates all the policy recommendations and recommendations for treaty changes. I'm aware that when I say treaty change recommendations, some people will say, hey, the changes for the treaties, who's going to do that? But still, we have developed it. Um, based upon our research findings, and then, of course, the very important new narrative for a European integration that is fit for the 21st uh, century. In the heart of that new narrative, we think there is a firm place for democracy and rule of law and the other fundamental values of the European uh, Union. Um, you have, besides, in your documentation, a little booklet to which we're going to refer because it basically has an excerpt of the main part, the most important part of the new narrative, and also the 30 recommendations, yes, it's a nice figure, 30 final recommendations, policy recommendations, recommendations for treaty changes that we have uh, developed and to which we're going to refer in a few um, uh, minutes. But allow me first to give you a brief uh, kind of uh, guide through the program this afternoon a very dense and packed program. We'll do very strict time management. Um, and we're very grateful that we have received a video address by the Commission Vice President and Vice Chair of the Conference on the Future of Europe, Dubravka Switcha. After her address, my Reconnect colleague and friend, Paul Blocker, and I will, represent, will present those uh, two things, the new narrative and um, the policy and treaty change recommendations. And then we are delighted that we will have the President of the General Court of the EU, Mark van der Waude, uh, with his intervention on the rule of law in Europe, demands and challenges for the European judiciary. And to link back to a more democratic perspective, we will hear from Professor Daniel Thomas uh, about the challenge and the importance of liberal democratic values for the EU's future. After those two interventions, we will enjoy a presentation of the legacy, because we're meant to leave something behind, a legacy of the Reconnect project, and all the ways in which you all can stay reconnected and connected to the project after uh, today. We'll have a coffee break, yes, and after that break, we will get to listen to a very rich panel of Reconnect researchers and external voices who will debate a roadmap for rebuilding citizens' trusts. And we close the final day of our conference on a very high note with the closing keynote of Herman Count van Rompuy, the President Emeritus of the European uh, Council. And after that full day of interventions and insights, we will be very happy to welcome you to a reception in the lounge here of the Fondation. I wish you all a very inspiring conference and please allow me now to introduce Dubravka Switcha. She was nominated as a candidate for European Commissioner from Croatia, and she was assigned the role of Vice President for Democracy and Demo Demography 
as of 1st of December 2019 in the von der Leyen Commission. In that role, she is leading the Commission's work on deliberative democracy and vice-chairing the Conference on the Future of Europe, which gives people a say on how the EU is to be run and how it should look like in the future. And as you know, this conference is also nearing the end of its works. We are very pleased to have received a video message from her, so I'm very happy to give her now the floor, or should I say, the screen. Thank you very much. Vice President for Democracy and Demography, I am impressed at Reconnect's achievements over its four-year project. Your work brings together researchers across 18 universities in 14 member states and also non-EU countries. Your work contributes to building a new narrative for and between the European Union and its citizens. Reconciling the European Union with its citizens through democracy and the rule of law is part of what we in the European Commission work on every day. Today, we do it in the context of the largest ever exercise in deliberative democracy, the Conference on the Future of Europe. The conference itself takes places against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic and the tragedy of aggressive war in Ukraine. Both are transformative for our societies and democracy. Now, more than ever, we must provide citizens with a safe, open and transparent public space to engage with their democracy. A resilient democracy requires strong institutions and structures and, of course, active, engaged citizens. It means having the ability to evolve and respond to the needs of citizens using all the tools at our disposal. Because democracy itself is not static, we must find different ways to get to know our citizens better, to establish trust, to establish solidarity, including across generations, to have a frank exchange on how we can work better together. The Conference on the Future of Europe is an example of deepening citizen engagement and European, at the European level through deliberative democracy practices. That is also why last year the Commission set up a competence centre on participatory and deliberative democracy. It aims to raise awareness and build capacity on deliberative practices among European Union institutions, member states and research and policy organisations. We are also supporting research to advance the knowledge bases about democracy, its challenges and its transformations. Reconnect is one among many projects funded by Horizon 2020. Several future Horizon Europe research calls will aim at supporting research on protecting democracy and participatory governance styles across political cultures. Citizens are at the heart of the conference process. From the beginning of the conference, I have trusted citizens to deliver their input into the multilingual digital platform, the European Citizens Panel, and the plenary is the basis of our work. The Commission's priority is to ensure that citizens are heard and feel included as full partners in the deliberations. The core idea of the Conference of the Future of Europe is that deliberations about the future of the European Union take place at all levels across borders and across languages, across cultures and histories, leaving no one and nowhere behind. European Union policymaking is not simply top-down. Through the conference, we are engaged in an exercise bringing us closer to citizens. However, the Kremlin is launching military action against Ukrainian citizens that have voiced their European aspirations. We see this as also being an attack on our democracy, on our values, on our aspirations and on our way of life. We can never take our democracy for granted. We have to work on it together every day at all levels. A healthy democracy relies on citizen engagement and not only at election times. The Conference of the Future of Europe has shown us that the period between elections is one rich with ideas. All four European citizens' panels have finished their work. They have come up with 178 recommendations on a wide array of topics for our future. The plenary last met on the weekend of 8th April to fine-tune the recommendations into proposals. 
On 29th to 30th April, we will have a final plenary and conclude this phase of the conference on the 9th of May with a high-level political event to present the outcomes. A clear message from citizens across all topics is that they want citizens' assemblies and more participatory tools to be integrated into European Union policy making. When it comes to democracy and institutional governance, there too citizens put forward ambitious proposals. All aim at making the bodies and institutions of the European Union more accountable, more transparent and responsive. We are at a decisive stage of the conference. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, I want to emphasize how important it is that citizens recognize their efforts and input in the proposals coming out of the conference. This gives legitimacy to the whole process of the conference. As this phase of the conference comes to a close, the work does not stop. The success of the conference will be measured on the concrete results that we can de deliver for our citizens. The European Commission has committed to follow up swiftly to the conference conclusions. And I count on your continued engagement as we start into the next phase of the conference after the 9th of May. The building of democratic connections, legitimacy and trust helps reinforce our democracy at home and abroad for current and future generations. The Conference on the Future of Europe is a vital step in making our democracy fit for the future. The European Union was able to build the basis for the next generation of Europeans to have the same peace and same prosperity that those of my generation aspired to and achieved. Current events in Ukraine remind us of this. We can never take our democracy for granted. We need a rich contribution and participation of representatives at all levels. We must get this right if we want to build a democracy that is worthy of the name. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Anna Gora, and I'm representing the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here today to uh, introduce our next speakers, Paul Walker and Jan Wouters. Um, and I just wanted to underline that the reports that they will present really do um, combine all of the research that has undergone um, in has been done by the Reconnect Consortium as a whole over the last uh, four years. So these are really the final products of our project. Um, so uh, Jan Bouters is, um, in addition to coordinating the whole Reconnect project, he's also a full professor of international law and international organizations at KU Leuven, where he is also the Jean Monnet Chair ad personam and the founding director of the Institute for International Law and the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies, um, the latter of which is both a Jean Monnet and the KU Leuven Chair of Excellence. He's also the president of KU Leuven's International Policy Council. Professor Wouters is visiting professor at uh, the College of Europe, Sciences Po and Louis, and an adjunct professor at Columbia University, and he's also um, of counsel at Linklater's. He has published extensively on international and EU law, global governance, corporate finance and financial law. Um, and our second speaker, Paul Blocker, is associate professor in political sociology at the Department of Sociology and Business Law at the University of Bologna. He's also the research coordinator at the Institute of Sociological Studies at Charles University in Prague. And his research focuses on the sociology of constitutions, constitutional politics, democratic participation, and populism. And then without uh, further ado, um, I would invite Paul to uh, step up to the podium to uh, introduce Reconnect's new narrative for European integration. Thank you so much, Anna, for your, uh, for your really kind introduction. This is a bit of a, an emotional moment because we're at the end uh, of the Reconnect project. And, and I had the pleasure, or I was actually punished, you might say, uh, to take up the uh, work package on a new narrative uh, for the European Union, for the European Integration Project. Um, I wanted right away to stress the fact that the new narrative is not something that I 
personally came up with. Uh, it has been clearly uh, a collective a group effort um, of the whole Reconnect project, considering also in a systematic manner uh, the various research outputs that we have created. Um, but it has also been further uh, beyond the sort of the Reconnect uh, research and deliverables, including, for instance, in a, a very um, extensive survey with citizens throughout European countries. Um, it has also built on an internal questionnaire where I sort of harassed colleagues trying to tease out their specific uh, views and positions on, on European integration, uh, stemming also from the research. And, uh, and it was further uh, extensively debated in two workshops. Uh, it was supposed to be one, but the first one was at the end of November last year in Prague, and Prague had one of its uh, COVID moments, so we uh, uh, um, set up a second workshop last March, uh, in which we um, extensively discussed a new narrative. Um, the new narrative, in a way, really tries to respond to the, the core question of, of the Reconnect project, that is how to reconcile European citizens uh, with uh, the European Union through uh, democracy and the rule of law. Um, and the new narrative, um, which you don't really have yet, because I think it's not officially published yet, but you have an excerpt at least, um, the new narrative is set up in a kind of triptych way, uh, three uh, different components. The first part is really um, the, what you could call, meta-narrative, or polity narrative, a comprehensive narrative, which takes into account the history, the past, the present, uh, and also the future uh, of the European project in a very specific way, in a distinctive reading uh, of that story of European integration. The second part is really testing, in a way, the narrative in the four uh, policy areas in which uh, Reconnect has been researching. Um, that part I won't discuss extensively today. There won't be uh, much time for that, but of course I invite you to carefully read it when uh, it becomes public. The third part is perhaps the most important part indeed, and there you have the excerpt. Um, that is the future-oriented part of the, uh, the narrative, um, which links up with EU reform, potentially even uh, treaty change, as mentioned by Jan. Uh, and in that sense, it flows right into uh, that second, uh, much more extensive report on uh, reforms, treaty changes in the areas uh, of democracy um, and the rule of law. So, well, one, one key question remains, of course, um, why do we need a narrative? Why do we need a new narrative? Um, one of the core reasons, I think, is that indeed uh, the European integration has been from the start uh, a very dynamic um, process and project, but at the same time also a very conflictive uh, project. Uh, and so in many ways, uh, one needs to, in a way, to um, reinvent uh, the European integration, reinvent its European identity, uh, so that it is able to speak uh, to wider European societies, societies, citizens and others. Um, and so, in a way, our new narrative tries to respond to the challenge of what you could call, some authors call it, a poly crisis. By now, a set of accumulated crises. Some of them have not really gone away, like the uh, economic crisis. Others have come on top of that. Um, but it also tries to speak to uh, what you could see as a never really fully reconcilable plurality of narratives of what European integration is about. Um, and so on the one hand, we try through a new narrative to create a, a pluralistic, an inclusive, an open uh, uh, narrative, also open to change. Uh, but at the same time, of course, we have to identify key markers of commonality uh, that allow, uh, not in the last place, citizens to make some kind of sense out of the European integration project. Uh, to feel themselves, and that's perhaps even a more important part, um, engaged part of what you could call indeed a com uh, political community. Um, and so there, uh, that's exactly where the narrative comes in. The European narrative should be a vehicle in a way for ongoing uh, identification, but also for ongoing um, um, reflection uh, on uh, uh, the European project. Um, and so there are a couple of elements, I think, that we really want to stress in this narrative, and that, first of all, um, 
a new narrative is needed uh, because we cannot just simply recraft narratives from the top down, uh, from the side of us, in a way, intellectual scholars, or from the side of the institutions. A new narrative would really uh, need to be able to um, include the various societal narratives as well out there, the competing narratives, something that we have extensively done in some very densely, I'm afraid, and uh, long uh, uh, deliverables produced within in our work package. So one element of our argument is that a new narrative needs to take into societal, uh, into account societal ideas, positions, etc. Uh, a second uh, aspect is that we shouldn't take this new narrative as a finalized narrative. Um, it is clearly uh, a dynamic uh, vehicle uh, for ongoing reflection uh, on the European integration process. And exactly uh, a finalized narrative would actually, uh, uh, in some ways, be undemocratic, would not allow new voices um, to play, um, to, to, to contribute to the European integration project uh, now and in the future. Um, and so, uh, a new narrative is needed indeed uh, in the last place and perhaps even also in the, in the first place uh, to connect or to try to perhaps in a dramatic way to finally connect European citizens uh, to the European project in particularly by in many ways reimagining I would say the core values that we know so well as being codified in Article uh, 2 of the Treaty on the European Union. Um, so very briefly on the polity um, uh, narrative, this, this, this comprehensive narrative of Europe as a, a political project, as a political community, um, we consider that, as it is uh, uh, very often stated, of course, uh, that the European integration process is in many ways a, an anti-totalitarian project, a project that reacts to the immediate past uh, and tries to overcome that past. It's striking how relevant this part is once again today. But at the same time, we consider in our narrative that the institutionalization of the European Union, um, and if we revisit the 50s, by the way, in terms of the history of European integration, lots of interesting things could be still said there. Uh, but if we look at that process of institutionalization of European integration, we rather see, unfortunately, um, a project that is less directly focused on democracy, democratic in engagement, citizenship, and much more on a kind of technocratic top-down um, economic and then in due course uh, legal uh, project. Um, of course this has changed and now I get to the present indeed. The process of European integration has come a long way since the 50s and particularly as we very well know in the 80s and 90s, we see a great acceleration um, through Maastricht and other uh, dimensions. Um, it also has seen uh, an enormous enlargement, uh, which hasn't uh, still uh, stopped. It even has seen its first withdrawal through Brexit. Um, as we've seen in particular, and I think that's an important point to make, uh, an ongoing technocratic exercise, but at the same time also an increasingly uh, evident political dimension uh, of European integration. Um, um, so we see this in all kinds of uh, different dimensions, if we would call that still the present predicament, the present position. The Lisbon Treaty is a very important marker of our current condition, condition the Charter of Fundamental Rights as well. Um, and so the European uh, project through the Lisbon Treaty and also through the Charter clearly identifies core principles, um, but at the same time, becoming more politically institutionalized has also me meant uh, that the EU has become increasingly politicized and publicly contested. Um, this is indeed uh, 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 exacerbated in many ways by the various crises that we've seen, which the EU cannot really claim, I'm afraid, uh, to uh, uh, have handled particularly well in some cases, in particular, I would say, the economic crisis, but also the migration crisis comes to mind. Um, so we are in a situation in which we have a deeper form of integration. It goes beyond an EU as a simply as a, as a market project. Uh, but at the same time, we see increasing politicization. We see the emergence, as we'll hear later in the afternoon as well, of various kinds of critique. We used to call it Euroscepticism. Now populism is one of the uh, identifying markers there. Um, and um, in this particular present moment, we also see uh, 
a, a acknowledgement uh, that something needs to be done. I believe uh, the speech we heard before me uh, uh, by Commissioner Schwietje um, is exactly indicating the Conference on the Future of Europe as a reflection on the fact that Europe needs to move forward in some way or the other. It needs to change um, um, its, its way of doing things. And that brings me exactly to the future as a part of the polity narrative, uh, which we suggest should orient itself towards what you could call either a democratic uh, or a citizen's union. Um, and so the politicized union needs to become also a democratically politicized union, um, particularly in current times, as was rightly stated, in which the whole idea of democracy uh, is dramatically attacked. Um, so big questions like whether we should uh, keep on stressing the intergovernmental nature of the EU, as was stressed also yesterday, for instance, the day before, uh, or whether we should actually try, as was originally the idea in European integration, to overcome in some ways forms of nationalist strife, forms of sovereignism, I would call it nowadays. These are huge questions. And we, in our narrative, we suggest that the EU rather wants to take a courageous um, and imaginative leap uh, forward. Um, in that sense, our narrative, the core message is that there are a number of unfulfilled promises that were there in the 50s that are often forgotten, like democratic activism, uh, attempts of uh, uh, getting citizens more clearly involved, uh, and also, indeed, uh, ideas of the rule of law uh, and of human rights. Uh, but these pr promises, in many ways, remain unfulfilled. Uh, and so that exactly brings me to the uh, the third part of the narrative, which regards reform, um, which we have um, packaged in a, a slightly more uh, popular way, or you might even say perhaps populist way, uh, as five takeaways. Um, the first takeaway is, is exactly that even if the EU has tried to democratize in the various uh, commission um, initiatives, etc., we claim as a Reconnect project having this very much in-depth research that there's still much to be done. And so one uh, first uh, takeaway is that the unfulfilled democratic promise needs to be taken very seriously. And I'm saying this on a personal note in a way, the Conference on the Future of Europe both shows how necessary this is, but also how little it actually reverberates in European society with European citizens. I'm asking my students all the time, have you ever heard of this? And they look at me like, what, what are you talking about? This is a problem. Um, and so we stress that both the democratic nature of the EU itself, um, but also its capacities to monitor democracy throughout Europe, uh, not, of course, uh, um, forgetting here about those backsliding states, but many of our democracies have great problems. Uh, the union might step up its um, capacities uh, and its in its ways of protecting democracy uh, in this regard. Uh, a second takeaway is that in this, we need more serious attempts, more systematic attempts, rather than ad hoc attempts, uh, to create forms of bottom-up inclusive governance. Um, and so a systematic inclusion of wider society and European citizens, which can be done in many different ways, and I've been following particularly closely the democratic part of the discussions in the Conference on the Future of Europe, where many interesting ideas have been brought forward. Uh, and so this could be definitely be taken up in terms of reflections on what blocks democratization in the EU. One dimension might be, for instance, also uh, unanimity as a core principle uh, in what is supposed to be a democratic union. Um, the third dimension is that the EU should be tap into its imaginative capacities, reimagining institutions, maybe even reinvent institutions uh, in the uh, context on the Conference on the Future of Europe. One might think of a permanent citizens' assembly as a kind of uh, uh, way of re-engaging also citizens uh, with European uh, policy making, with European uh, integration. Um, a fourth takeaway is that we think that the rule of law uh, needs a more robust defense than is currently the case. Um, and in this regard, the rule of law cannot be simply seen as an institutional principle. And again, um, it was mentioned, I'm a sociologist, I can't help thinking of the rule of law also in a societal way. 
the rule of law needs to be rooted in society. It needs to be part of societal interaction. Otherwise, it actually hardly exists. And we know this from cases on the ground, unfortunately, where very well researched uh, by our rule of law researchers in Reconnect. The final takeaway, then, is um, the idea that we need to strengthen uh, and expand fundamental rights, maybe even think of, indeed, uh, reforming or amending uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, and this is also from the uh, perspective that a democratic union, indeed a citizens' union, uh, needs to be uh, robustly embedded in a widely shared democratic human rights uh, and rule of law culture. And this is exactly what our um, narrative asks us uh, to focus on in the future of Europe. Thank you so much. Now comes the more, even more impossible part, um, summarizing 30 recommendations for policy and treaty changes. It's a bit boring, to be honest, and that's why we have in the booklet those uh, 30 um, recommendations. But before going into that and showing you the boring slides with all the enumeration of those recommendations, let me quickly highlight some of the main research findings, both on democracy and rule of law. Why? Because only with that in mind you can fully understand why we highlighted certain things in our recommendations. First of all, on the state of democracy in the EU without any comprehensive uh, kind of picture, let me just highlight that we found that there are significant variations in the quality of democracy also at the national level of the member states. That there is indeed an important correlation between um, the development and the resilience of civil society and the quality of public debate and the quality of democracy as such. If you have a poorly developed, poorly uh, functioning civil society, if the civil society is also in a way um, uh, attacked by governments, if you have a poor level of public debate in which, in fact, political opponents are displayed as enemies of the people, as not as respectable uh, politicians, then we are uh, not doing well in the quality of our democracies. And we have found those things happening at a very worrying uh, level. We've also had some very nuanced findings about populism. Uh, we have found out that not all populist parties, for instance, are anti-democratic. But some of them do drive certain efforts to undermine liberal values. I already spoke about the deterioration of the quality, the level of public discourse in various uh, member states. Speaking of the European Parliament elections themselves, where we had the privilege of really having a great case study, namely the 2019 uh, European uh, elections, we still found out through a lot of research that there is little focus in the population on EU-related issues before, during, after those elections. They are still largely what we call second-order elections, and it's something problematic, we think. On the rule of law, the main findings, again, without being comprehensive, first of all, as we have said at the previous uh, conference on Tuesday, the notion of rule of law, the concept of rule of law, is very clearly established in European Union law. It cannot be continued to say that it's fake and that every country can have its own definition. No, that's clearly been debunked by uh, Reconnect uh, Research, um, but we do find lots of violations of rule of law principles in several member states. Independence of the judiciary has been attacked, political checks and balances have not been um, fully upheld, respect for fundamental rights, especially in the COVID-19 crisis, have become very uh, problematic. There's also what we call the danger of constitutional pluralism and identity, where the primacy of EU law has been attacked by various national, supreme or constitutional courts in a number of member states. At the EU level, we also see certain other problems, such as, for instance, still lack of transparency. And that's why we have a separate chapter on transparency recommendations in our uh, 30 recommendations. But also the fact that there is still not enough forceful action against corruption uh, at uh, member state level. So let me turn to those recommendations. We go to those 
as I said, boring slides. I hope they are legible at all. In any event, you have your booklet. And before I go into those 30 recommendations, let me say that uh, those recommendations do not all require treaty changes. Uh, some of them are only policy recommendations, are recommendations for opening a debate, a broad-based discussion, for instance, on the whole use of unanimity as a decision-making mode in the Council in quite a number of cases. Unanimity for reforming the treaties, we call for an open discussion about that, but also, for instance, on reviewing the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which, as you all know, is now with us for more than 20 years, and although it's a great document, I think some improvements can be made. So, so some uh, recommendations do call for treaty changes, others are more political or call for a new debate. It's been a balancing act, this whole thing you can imagine. We academics are, or have not been trained to write treaties. Eh? It's a very interesting exercise we went through, and I'm very grateful for our Reconnect Consortium because we had big discussions, and it's a balancing act in which, of course, a certain notion of feasibility has been in the back of our mind. Now, if you say feasibility stands first, then why should you even come up with a recommendation for a treaty change? We know how hard the treaties are to change today. Do you want to go into that area? We know also how sensitive this question is for the end results of the conference on the future of Europe. But still, I hope you will bear with me that if we, the academics, an academic consortium, does not even have the guts to come up with a reflection and with some proposals for treaty changes where we really think this will be helpful for making the union deliver to its citizens, restore trust in the union, and so on, then I don't think um, we play a useful role at all. And again, fe feasibility itself is an evolving notion. Who would have thought that a single currency was a feasible idea even 40 or 50 years ago. So these things can evolve, and we're not writing for tomorrow. We're also hoping to contribute to future debates. The structure of our recommendations, four big parts, one on democracy, one on rule of law, one on the charter of fundamental rights, one on transparency. Again, this is far too small to be legible, but you have your booklets. Let me quickly browse through some of the democracy strengthening recommendations. For instance, we have found that it is problematic for European elections when there are, let's say, other elections at the national, at the regional level, at the local level, too close to those elections. So we found it helpful to have something of a light coordination of electoral calendars to make sure that there will be enough voter turnout for the European elections. If you have just had a week before national ele elections, you can be pretty sure that there will be very low voter turnout for the European elections. We're not saying that uh, you have to weaken the democratic debate and having, you know, uh, those different elections spread too much from each other. No, it's just that light coordination of electoral calendars to make sure there's a proper place for European elections, which preferably should be held on weekend uh, rather than weekdays. Very obvious practical things. It doesn't require a treaty change as such, but you know, it really affects voter participation. Transnational electoral lists, very obviously, um, it's an idea that is not new. We see it now also being reawakened by uh, a committee in the European Parliament uh, in the recent uh, weeks. So we think that's going to be salutary to really lead to a more, let's say, a better legitimized European Parliament. Law uh, making is important and we do have this strange document, the 1976 EU Electoral Act, which is a little bit of a patchwork, which has evolved in the course of time, but to be very honest, which for many, many issues still simply refers to the national frameworks of the member states. And of course you could say, well, that's subsidiarity, but we have found really that there are such differences that it lead de facto to inequalities, to forms of discrimination of European citizens. So we think there needs to be an adaptation with a view, I'm not saying with a view to uniformity, I'm saying with a view to a stronger equivalence of national procedures for European Parliament elections. The Spitzenkandidat issue, I'm not going to go into the details, some in the room are much better qualified to do that, but we think it has to be resolved, because in 2024 we may again face the issue. Uh, 
And what we have to definitely prevent is a form of you know, blocking in the relationship between the European Council and the European uh, Parliament. Our colleagues in Lille also did great research about a novel practice of the European Commission, namely to make uh, visits to national and even regional parliaments at member state level. And we think that's a good idea, but the recommendation is to make those commission visits more public, organize them really as interactive hearings, and in that sense really activate the role of national parliaments um, as a form of accountability mechanism. We go to the next slide. Um, a couple of recommendations in which I'm not going to go, uh, enter in detail regarding the Eurozone, the governance of the Eurozone, make it more accountable and legitimate. As you know, many of these reforms have been done in the crisis mode, and we all know the EU makes progress when there are crises. But on the other hand, we really think there is a need for reintegration in the treaty framework and some additional, if you say, war, uh, guarantees with regard to the democratic functioning of the Eurozone um, governance uh, system. Unanimity in the Council we find problematic. And let's face it, I mean, this has been an evergreen uh, at successive treaty changes, Maastricht, Amsterdam, Lisbon Treaty has reduced at least 30 cases of unanimity uh, replaced by qualified majority. But you have to be aware there's still more than 80 cases of unanimous decision making in the EU, including on Article 7, including on non-discrimination, including on many, many sensitive issues such as common foreign and security policy. Here, we're of course not simply uh, recommending change, uh, uh, unanimity by qualified majority voting, we're calling for a debate. And one of the first ones to call that, remember at the end of its term, the Juncker Commission has also published a document calling for a new discussion about unanimity. Also, uh, Ursula von der Leyen in some of her State of the Union speeches has called for that. Likewise, and probably more revolutionary, we call for a debate about unanimity at the level of the treaty reform process, even more touchy, even more sensitive, if you wish, but still we think we have to discuss this because at a certain moment we simply will not have enough legitimate um, constitutional reform uh, processes. Then there are proposals to establish an EU democracy framework with, as a kind of complementary repertoire of measures to the existing ones essentially to address the problem of democratic backsliding by member states. I won't go into detail. It's complementary to the current democracy action plan of the European Commission. Recommendation 13 is a little bit sensitive, or at least uh, we have heard some comments about it yesterday, namely it's the idea of establishing an Athens Commission. The beautiful term Athens Commission, of course, refers to the place where democracy was born. It will not be an additional layer of bureaucracy. That's not how we see it. We see it as a monitoring body to really monitor the quality of public discourse. Remember what I said, our findings are that there is an alarming deterioration in the quality of public discourse in many member states. We think that an expert body is useful to monitor uh, that. Last but not least, as already indicated in the new narrative, uh, a light institutionalization of one of the main, we think, achievements of the Conference on the Future of Europe, namely a form of um, uh, institutionalization of a European citizens' assembly where we think one should give particular attention to young people. I come to the rule of law. Strengthening the rule of law. As said, we don't need a new conceptual framework. It's all there. Rule of law components have been clearly defined in EU law, great case law of the European Court of Justice. Those of you who were with us on Tuesday will remember that we had a closing lecture by Professor Kuhn Lenaerts, the president of the Court of Justice, and I'm sure that you all enjoyed the great didactical force of Professor Lenaerts' lecture in which he basically took us paragraph by paragraph through the recent landmark judgments of the European Court of Justice. So, I mean, it's great. It's all there in EU law. The main problem and the main challenge is implementation, enforcement, making sure it is going to be properly um, respected. That requires, for instance, that we should also have a regulator monitoring. And you would say, well, why do you need a treaty change? Because we know there has been issues with the legal service of the council saying you don't have the competence, the EU, to monitor rule of law at member state level. Well, we say, okay, let's end that debate by having it clearly laid down in the treaties. Similar issues, area of freedom, security, and justice becomes a little bit more technical, but there, as you may know, 
you really need mutual trust between member states. And mutual trust, mutual recognition can only happen if rule of law principles are respected at the national level. So we call also for a monitor mechanism there. The treaties are not perfect. We have to face that. Article 7 is problematic. Right? There is too much unanimity. There are too many veto players out there. So you have to, in a way, make Article 7 more credible and more efficient. We have a couple of recommendations in that sense. We also have recommendations about the existing procedures, which, as Professor kuhn Lenartz has indicated on Tuesday, are really great. I mean, preliminary references, um, the infringement procedures, remember also how President Lenartz also highlighted the responsibility of member states in this whole process, not just the Commission. But so, I mean, those tools are there. There has been great practice, not always uh, the greatest practice, but it's there. And we actually call for a note, a kind of interpretative notice, to basically make clear what the available procedures are before the Court of Justice um, before the Luxembourg courts in case of a violation of fundamental values of the EU. Likewise, a, a notice showing the current force and uh, meaning of Article 19. Again, um, the case law was explained again by Professor Lenartz on Tuesday, taking stock of the very rich case law that the court has produced in the past couple of years. There are a number of additional specific things, such as the idea of having, uh, considering introducing specific remedies in the context of rule of law backsliding. A bit of a controversial idea is to establish also a conference um, that would bring together the heads of the national constitutional and supreme courts of the member states with um, the heads of the European Union uh, courts with not a compulsory jurisdiction, but some, of, uh, some kind of advisory jurisdiction on issues like union competence. Why? Simply also to tackle the whole question of constitutional identity, constitutional pluralism debate that we have been seeing, but also the regular, uh, let's say, problems of confrontation between Supreme or Constitutional Courts on the one hand and Luxembourg on the other hand. We think it would be a good thing to have a forum, and in fact, those forums exist, it's just a matter of bringing it a little bit more systematically uh, together. Findings about anti-corruption. We want to strengthen OLAF, uh, make it possible they publish their reports to name and shame member states who are not following up on OLAF uh, findings. Uh, make more incentives for participation in the European Public Prosecutor's Office um, and enhance also the functioning of the authority for European political parties. I'm nearly at the end. Um, I'm going to um, the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Next slide, please. And the uh, transparency framework. The Charter is a beautiful document, and it's been brought to life by great case law of the Court of Justice. But we have to face some shortcomings, and there is the scope of application. And uh, we think that should be uh, looked at again in order to also strengthen its effective uh, enforcement at the national uh, level. Then also we think it's time to launch again a broad-based process about the content of the Charter. Are there new generations of human rights we want to bring in? Are there certain of the existing rights principles that we want to strengthen? Because also the Charter at the time was a compromise uh, result. And that we think should be a broad-based process, a convention, but also thinking again about citizens' representation and especially representation of young uh, people. Transparency is, of course, um, also a very flashy uh, subject, but we really think there are serious issues here. Only the very fact that the transparency regulation from 2001 has never been updated to reflect the changes of the Treaty of Lisbon is hugely problematic. Also, in the ordinary legislative procedure, we see lots of practices, the trilogue meetings, other documents that are being used and that are never really been um, available in the public domain. We think there should be far more transparency in that procedure as well. And then we really think that also digital governance, well-kept um, digital document registries, there is still a room, a great room for improvement. And last but not least, in the area of international trade, where one of the case studies of Reconnect has been, to look at the legitimacy of international trade agreements of the European Union, there too we think there is still room for improvement in terms of transparency at the level of the negotiation and the mandate of those uh, agreements, but also with regard to their implementation. 
That's it. That's what we recommend. And you can, of course, say, hey, I'm missing a lot of things. We have tried to bring evidence-based recommendations based upon the four-year research project we have been doing, and we will be very happy to engage in a debate with you about those recommendations. Thank you very much. So thank you, Professor uh, Welters and Professor Blocker. Um, luckily, we have about five minutes um, to take some questions, and I'm sure there are many. So uh, um, I thought we would uh, maybe take one question from the live audience, and then if there's time, take one question from our digital audience. Thank you. Um, I'm sure I should have had an opportunity at an earlier stage to have my say on the Spitzenkandidat process, but I'm going to raise it anyway. How would you propose resolving it? Um, the recommendation is that it should be resolved, and we have a situation where with France under a pro-European president, they drove a coach and horse, horses through the original idea of the Spitzenkandidat process. If a different president of France were to be in the driving seat in 2024, it could be even more to the disadvantage of the European Parliament. So are we proposing as ReConnect to say the European Parliament should be given a stronger say or pushing it back to the Council? Shall I? <laughs> Julie, you and I have clearly been watching the presidential debate yesterday evening. <laughs> No, I mean, uh, it was fascinating, it was at the same time alarming, because you can indeed imagine what will happen if that other person becomes the next president of France. Yes, and that is something which no Reconnect or Horizon 2020 project can do anything about. Let's face that. And it's the Spitzenkandidat issue is, uh, in that sense, it's, it's, it's just one of the issues. We felt we needed to address the issue because it has been really dealt with, in our sense, in our, mean, in our view, in a problematic manner in 2019. 2014, as we all know, was entirely different when, in fact, Juncker was proposed and that basically on European Council went along and so on. 2019, we had a person who became president of the European Commission without even ever, ever having stood as a candidate in European elections. So it's clear that something needs to be done with the selection process, but also in the relationship, we think, between the European Parliament and the European Council. Complex relationship, because as we all know, they represent totally different constituencies or democratic uh, kind of, uh, uh, say, um, uh, basis. So we are not saying that we should favor the European Parliament as opposed to the European Council. I think we have to make them work together. And in a certain way, what we are recommending is a bit copies, copied or inspired by the uh, special kind of um, reconciliation committee that you have at the level of the ordinary legislative procedure, where at a certain moment a delegation from the European Parliament sits together with council delegation and they broker a compromise. We think something like that should probably also be done in order to avoid really uh, big problems at the level of the election of the European Commission president. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we have two minutes, so maybe a very quick question, and then we'll have to wrap up. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned a transnational a list for the European Parliament election, and my question would be, um, can they be implemented in the European Parliament elections 2024, and if yes, uh, how? Okay, I guess it's again addressed to me. <laughs> it, it, it's getting late, it's getting late, because we know that, um, I mean, to have real transnational lists, we need to make changes to the actual electoral act. And the electoral act is, as I said, it's a particular instrument, because as such, it's, it's, it's an ad attachment to a council decision of 1976, but it's a constitutional document. I would be inclined to call it part of primary law, so any change to the EU Electoral Act will also require national ratification according to the constitutional procedures of all the member states. To get this all still in order before the 2024 elections is probably going to be a little bit tight. But that doesn't mean we should postpone the whole discussion. And again, I was very happy to see also recent um, proposals being adopted at the level of the parliamentary committees in the European Parliament. So I really would think we have to do it now. 
Yep, thank you very much. And uh, we are now out of time, but um, I am sure that uh, Professor Bouters and Professor Blocker would be happy uh, to chat with any of you um, after the conference if you have any more questions. And we'll now turn the stage over to our next panel. Thank you. Many thanks to the first panel. Uh, my name is Päivi Leina Sandberg. I come from the University of Helsinki. And now I have the great honor to invite our next speaker. He is Mark van der Baude, who is uh, president of General Court of the EU since uh, 2019, I think. Uh, but he's actually one of those people who've seen uh, EU law from many, many different perspectives. He's been a judge uh, in the General Court. Uh, before that, he was a professor at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. And before that, he's also served in the legal service of the European Commission uh, and a DG in the European Commission. So we could see that actually he has various uh, different perspectives into these issues. Uh, and today he will be talking about um, the rule of law in Europe, uh, demands and challenges for the European judiciary. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very prestigious conference and thank you for all the work which uh, your consortium has done. And I look forward to debates to come. Uh, before turning to the uh, issue of demands and challenges of, of, for the European judiciary, let me make three remarks about the topic of today, uh, democracy and the rule of law. Some general remarks before I go to the specific element of the EU judiciary. Uh, first, uh, it must be clear that democracy and rule of law issues are very issues which give rise to diverging views. Uh, especially now you see that in some member states uh, the views are quite worrying. I think it's important to bear in mind that what we consider perhaps as intellectuals, as I say, the concept of rule of law and democracy is not necessarily the same as how others look at it. I think it's to have this openness of mind is important. Secondly, these two concepts are very abstract uh, in nature. Uh, we feel that they are important as the means to convey messages, to to, to channel say, processes on various issues. Uh, democracy and rule of law, uh, you can't touch them. Uh, whereas people in the countries, in the member states, will think about other things, uh, which are more tangible. Uh, for example, climate change, income inequality, security nowadays, or perhaps even a real or perceived loss of sovereignty. Uh, so it's important to bear that in mind as well. Right? They are overarching values. They are means to channel, say, uh, public causes. And it's very difficult to get that across. Uh, the third thing I would like to say as an introductory remark is that um, yeah, we all feel, of course, that there is need to change something, and that the treaties need to be changed. Uh, in the light of the many challenges we have been facing, all these crises to which uh, Professor Jan Wouters just referred, require a change. Um, but is it a feeling of EU-centered intellectuals, as we presumably are here today, or is it also something which lives, say, in the member states? When I drive back home, far from Brussels or Luxembourg, um, the worries I have are not necessarily the worries uh, of the people in the land. And I must applaud, of course, the, the efforts made by uh, the Commission, as we heard from the Commissioner, and by this group, to connect or reconnect uh, people to the Union. Even so, uh, all these, say, remarks being made, um, I think uh, we are all aware of the difficult context in which uh, democracy and rule of law evolve in the member states. I think we should not be too contemplative about it. Uh, I think we should be more straightforward. Uh, 
the rule of law and democracy are precious. They take a long time to build and can be taken away very quickly. So we need to be strong on those issues. The second point I would like to make in the same vein is to say that we, have not, we should not be too sophisticated when it comes to the rule of law. Uh, the rule of law is certainly not law and order. Uh, that's one thing we have to be clear about. What we also need to be clear about is there can be no rule of law without democracy and there can be no democracy without the rule of law. They go hand in hand. Why is that so? Uh, because if you don't have democracy, you will have authority or authoritarian persons taking decisions as they think fit. They may be right or wrong decisions, but they will always be arbitrary decisions. Arbitrariness is the contrary of the rule of law. That's why I think democracy and rule of law go together. Now, these introductory remarks being made, let me now turn to these two elements, demands and challenges for the European judiciary. It looks like a bit of a, a trade union talk, but I will not do that. <laughs> I will focus more on more, say, intellectual issues. First, what is the EU judiciary? Of course, you will say, what a strange question. Uh, this person is supposed to be the president of the general court. He says, he has having this identical question, who are they? Of course, there are the judges in Luxembourg uh, of the general court, the court of justice. But not only that, and I think that's important to bear in mind, the group is larger. If you have a look at Article 19 of the Union Treaty, you will see that the EU judiciary includes national courts when they apply national law in the member states. They are the first port of call when it comes to the rights of the EU citizens which they derive from the treaties. And the mechanism by which this all works is this preliminary reference mechanism set up by Article 267. So it's important, I think, also in this idea of connecting or reconnecting people, that judges, EU judges, are not the justices only in, in Luxembourg, in futuristic buildings. No, it's also the judge right around the block. Why is this important to know? I think uh, it's important to know that we act as a group, national judges and EU judges together in administrating EU law. It's important for the mutual trust between member states and the actors in these member states. That's obvious. Perhaps less obvious is the fact that if you don't perceive, the, say, the EU judiciary as a whole, as a body that's grants rights or make sure that you get judicial protection in the member states, that member states who are not aware of that treat their citizens badly. If I cannot get my rights in one member state because the EU judiciary doesn't perform its functions in that member state, I don't treat my citizens well. Because a citizen in a country where the rule of law works will get his rights. Whereas <laughs> the same citizen in another member state that disregards the rule of law will not serve its citizens well. So those member states who don't obey the rule of law from an EU perspective shoot themselves in the foot. Now, of course, when we think about member states that disregard the rule of law, we think of certain member states. But there are various ways to undermine the rule of law, and I think that is important also for the future. It's not only a direct attack on the independence of justice, but it also can be more stealth stealthily done, for example, by not giving enough resources to national judiciary when it exercises uh, judicial functions, also in an EU context. Uh, the rule of law can be eroded also in a financial way. Uh, for example, just perhaps as a side remark, uh, the case on the Association of Portuguese Judges was at the end of the day about the remuneration of judges. Uh, so that's also, I think, important to bear in mind. So the EU judiciary is wider than just the courts in Luxembourg. It also includes the uh, courts in the member states. And together, I would say, they form 
an integrated body which controls the executive and which interprets the law made by the legislator. In fact, we should start thinking in terms of a European trias politica. That brings me to the second question I would like to address. What is this EU judiciary supposed to do? Of course, you will say, eh, again, strange question. First, this person doesn't know who they are, and secondly, he wonders what they're supposed to do. It's not as obvious. Uh, of course, uh, when there's a case, any judge will deal it with it in a professional manner. And that also holds true, I think, of most judges, even judges in member states where the situation of the rule of law is critical. Right? Most judges are professionals. Um, my question is, however, that sometimes we expect too much and sometimes too little from uh, judges. And I will now focus on the EU courts in particular, so not the national courts, but the EU courts in Luxembourg. Um, I think we expect too much from the courts sometimes uh, because of the type of cases we get. Of course, uh, any judge sometimes gets societal cases with uh, a delicate component and things like that, but European courts get lots of them. And why is that so? That's because of the culture in which decisions are taken. It's a culture of compromise, which is good. Uh, speaking here in Belgium, it's a country that works perfectly well uh, under the culture of compromise. But compromise has a downside. Uh, it can be unclear. It can also be that you don't want to push the things too far and that you leave delicate issues undecided. And that then is put on the judge's plate. Uh, sometimes we get those issues in Luxembourg. Conversely, it can also be that in this decision-making culture, too much is regulated. People go too far in regulating things. I think sometimes I see regulations with as many recitals as there are operative parts, as if there was no trust uh, when the decisions were taken. And these ecosystems of rules, uh, 100 pages of regulations, start to interact with other ecosystems of rules. And sometimes you see, if you make long text like that, yet you get all sorts of conflicts which the legislature had not foreseen and which judges are supposed to solve. I think uh, that that is a problem which needs to be addressed on the long term. Of course, there's nothing wrong with judges dealing with delicate issues that happens in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Germany, everywhere. Uh, however, my intuition is, it's just an intuition, is that the decision-making at national level is in many respects better because at the end or in the process of decision-making, you have somewhere a council of state uh, which looks at the consistency of the case law. There was one of the recommendations by, uh, made by the, uh, by the conference uh, on the quality of legislation, uh, having something upstream, uh, a look at the quality of legislation before it is sent uh, into, the, uh, say, into the societas. So that's the one point I would like to address, uh, the fact that sometimes too much is required from EU judges, and that could be dealt with by having a look by some kind of council of state up front. The second thing is sometimes too much is expected from EU judges, uh, when they have spoken. And now I refer to the case law and the, the rule of law. Right. The court has spoken. The case law is clear as to what the independence of the judiciary should be. Uh, there's no point to lament anymore. It's now time for the member states and the institutions to act. And sometimes you can't expect the court to go on and on and on on the independence of the judiciary. It becomes a political issue. That's what I wanted to say on requesting too much from the judiciary. Sometimes it's also too little, which is expected from the judiciary. And then I look at my court in particular. Uh, when we think about the rule of law, we think of the member states, but there are also the institutions. Now, for example, the point of the transparency was mentioned. That's something, that issues which come to the general court, the, the transparency of decision-making. 
Uh, and there, uh, the signals we get, and I'll refer to the general code, as to the intensity of our review on what we're supposed to do in controlling these institutions is not always clear. Uh, I refer in particular to trade defense measures, for example, the relations we have with third countries, economic sanctions, or state aid issues, highly delicate issues. Uh, I think it's important that citizens, economic actors, and member states must have the certainty that when they go to a court, to the general court, that they get, say, a treatment uh, which is without any doubt uh, intense. I think we have uh, standards that satisfy that request, but I think it's an area of attention in particular in the field of state aid. And my last point is to the things where I say, well, perhaps too little is expected, is the access to courts. Uh, we have this integrated judiciary, and at the end of the day, everybody will find his or her way to court. But sometimes it's very complex. You have to go through a national court, and then you go to the Court of Justice via the preliminary reference procedure. It's all indirect. Whereas most of the decisions, especially in the field, for example, of environment or, say, digital acts, are dealt with at European level, would it not make sense when we review at the later phase the treaties to open up access to courts and to review the admissibility conditions as we have them now in the treaty? Uh, they all date from the, the 1950s. They have been interpreted in 1963. It might be time to be a bit more open. So that's what I wanted to say about who we are and what we are supposed to do. And at the end of the day, what I would like to say is that this EU judiciary is an integrated or should be seen increasingly as an integrated body with these national courts that together form a pillar controlling integrated uh, legislating machines by national parliaments, European parliaments, and the executive bodies, because it's more and more difficult to find a divide between what is national and European. It's all integrated. That happens at the administrative level, that happens at the legislative level, and it's also that's something that happens at judicial level. I thank you very much. Many, many thanks. Um, now I'm going to ask you to stay there for a few more minutes and then we'll see if we have a, one or two questions uh, from the audience. See hands there. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. Um, try, try to refresh my memory. Um, is it uh, so that uh, if uh, the, the general court, the European court cannot take a case if there is a, a national judge that or tribunal that has already taken it okay, for some reason. You, you cannot have priority over a national judge. It was so a long time ago, I don't know if it has been changed. Thank you. It, it's a very relevant question because, indeed, it's, it's what I meant exactly by opening up access to the general court. Because it's for the citizen or for economic actors, even for public authorities, not always clear on which door they should knock. Mm. There's a case law that says that if you could knock on the door of the general court, you're foreclosed from doing so before the national court. But sometimes that can be a bit late. Uh, there is. This case, though, which says, OK, you're foreclosed, but how could I know that I could go to the general court? Um, so it is a system where it is mutually exclusive. It's either the general court or the national court, but the system under which it works is not satisfactory, uh, according to my personal view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Alberto Alemano, a professor of European law at HEC Paris, uh, an institution you recently visited, I, I understand. Uh, thank you very much for sharing um, your own take on the role of European courts. Um, the, the role the European courts are called to play in the 
interpretation and uh, respect to the rule of law. And I really welcome, as a scholar, your idea to opening up access to justice in democratizing access because very much of the litigation happening before your court happened to be ex the exclusive prerogative of those plaintiffs who can actually afford sophisticated lawyers who are gonna be able to uh, get access and to plead in front of your court. So opening up means also democratizing and that's basically what the European Court of Justice has to do since 2009, which is this idea of becoming a participatory institution because it has to be opened up and this remains pretty much dead letter. Two questions for you. The first one is, to what extent admitting amicus curiae brief would be an intermediary step to somehow making access to justice much more inclusive? Is this something that the rules of procedure today could allow? Second question has to do with your point that I think has been very persuasively argued by you, saying that over time the European judicial system has become very integrated uh, there is more than a dialectic between national courts and the Court of Justice. There's a sense of common identity. To what extent the Article 255 Committee, which is expressing the suitability on the candidates put forward by the national state, has been playing a favorable role towards this Europeanization of the judicial system? What is your take on this second aspect? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for these, again, very uh, relevant questions. Uh, in in a certain sense, we have this amicus brief, of course, and because we have uh, under Article 40 of the statute on the Court of Justice the possibility for parties to intervene. Um, of course, the rules as to whether you can intervene or not is subject to interpretation. Uh, you could open up a bit, and that's, uh, that's one possibility to have more access to courts. Uh, now, I must also say, as a president of a court, that sometimes uh, having many interveners in complex cases doesn't make the thing easier. Huh? So that's uh, one point I would like, also like to stress. So not an invitation for all of you to come to court uh, the other day, because then it would probably paralyze the, the jurisdiction. Uh, the second point was on Article 255. Uh, indeed, it's an interesting phenomenon which was introduced by uh, the Lisbon Treaty to have this vetting of candidates proposed by member states. This committee is composed, and uh, you heard Mr. Rosas uh, a few days ago, it's also composed of uh, national courts, and I think indeed it contributes uh, to this idea. Uh, perhaps it could be even seen as, to say, the beginning of what could grow into a European Council for the Judiciary. And that could also match one of the recommendations uh, which uh, Jan Wouters mentioned on having a forum for the highest courts. Uh, there is something there to, to reflect upon. Um, but it's for, for sure, it is, say, this, this idea that a European judge is also assessed by his national colleagues is, I think, a, a great step forward made by the Treaty of Lisbon. Good, we have uh, two more minutes, so time for one more quick question. Thank you very much, uh, Laurent Pesch. Um, um, we, a few years ago with Alberto, we wrote uh, an article about the doubling in size of the general court. And so I'm not going to ask you a question about national courts and national judges, even though I would like to. But uh, I'm just going to ask you about uh, the productivity challenge, which essentially, or rather the, the caseload challenge, which justified the doubling in size of the general court. I'd like to, to ask for your view whether, in fact, the doubling was justified and has he produced what he was expected to produce in 2015. Thank you. Um, First, of course, the genesis of, of the doubling goes back to the 2015. So that's, uh, I would say, it, it's the past. Uh, it has produced results in terms of the duration of the proceedings. I think we still have progress to make, but if you see the statistics, whoop, uh, the duration has gone down. That's one element. The second element I would like to underline is to say the intensity of the review. That's also a point to which I just referred uh, during my, uh, my little speech. Uh, more and more cases are dealt with by extended formation. So more judges listen to your case. So you get a better quality of hearing. Moreover, a couple of years ago, and when you have a look at the academic literature 
of, let's say, 10, 15 years ago, the general court was said to be say, too differential towards the European institutions. If you now ask Mrs. Vestager whether the general court is too deferential, you will probably have another answer to that question. So that shows that people have their day in court. And that was, at the end of the day, I think, the objective of that reform. I think it's now time to thank Mark uh, for, for his presentation, but also all the interesting answers to the question, and then time to welcome our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Daniel Thomas. <laughs> so Daniel Thomas, he is Professor of International Relations uh, at Leiden University. He's spent his academic life in the US uh, in Ireland as well. Uh, but also, quite interestingly, I thought, during a sabbatical, also worked uh, for, the, for the European Commission uh, as an advisor um, on human rights and democracy. And now he's recently written a new book that came out last year uh, called The Limits uh, of Europe, Membership Norms and the Contestation of Regional Integration. And I think his presentation today will build partially on that book. Uh, it's called The Challenge and Importance of Liberal Democratic Values for the EU's Future. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very impressed by the work of the ReConnect project. As somebody who is, who is here today as an outsider to the project and just beginning to, to acquaint myself, I'm really very, very impressed by the quality of the work. Now, Professor Voucher has invited me to give some brief remarks on the challenge and the importance of liberal democratic values for the EU. And I welcomed that invitation. Those are topics that I care very deeply about, topics that I've been researching and teaching uh, about for, for many years. And I sat down to prepare my, my notes for, for today, and then I looked more closely at the program of this ReConnect final conference over three days, and I realized there was really no point in me trying to say in 15 minutes what a very qualified, diverse group of people have been working on for four years. So I took those notes and threw them in the bin. Uh, so what I decided to do instead on the same theme, but a different approach. What I've decided to do instead is to cast a critical eye on what I call the conventional narrative on liberal democracy and the EU. To do that, I draw on my own research, uh, including the book that was just mentioned, The Limits of Europe, which just came out, uh, but also very heavily on the work of other political scientists who work on in the field of EU studies, but also uh, other areas of, of political economy that I think uh, deserve more attention from people who work within the EU and people who work on the EU. Uh, I'll tell you in advance, uh, the result of my little uh, survey here is not comforting, um, but it's, I believe, important if we want to be, uh, it's important to be honest if we really care about the future of liberal democracy in, in Europe. So what do I mean by the conventional narrative on liberal democratic values and the EU? So to start, I believe this conventional narrative has, to start, has two assumptions. One assumption is that liberal democratic values are part of the EU's DNA. They're present from the beginning, and they're expressed clearly in Article 2 of the treaty. You all know the language. Respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. So that's assumption number one. It's part of the union's DNA. Second assumption, these values are not just desirable, they are essential to the good functioning of the union. Based on these two assumptions, we observe within this narrative, this conventional narrative, that the EU requires all states seeking membership uh, to exhibit the pillars of liberal democracy. So parliamentary democracy based on free and fair elections, and independent institutions guaranteeing rule of law, free media, respect for human rights, and so forth. Then there's a critique within the conventional narrative that the EU has strong mechanisms for promoting liberal democracy in candidate states, but relatively weak mechanisms to enforce these values in member states. That leads to an expression of concern 
that liberal democracy is now under threat in a handful of member states, most notably in Poland and especially Hungary, where the Prime Minister openly embraces illiberal democracy. And finally, the conventional narrative arrives at a prescription that the EU needs more political commitment and treaty change to overcome this challenge and restore its liberal democratic identity. That's what I call the conventional narrative. So my assessment. The conventional narrative is comforting. The EU is not perfect, but it's on the right side of history. The conventional narrative is also partially correct. The rule of law is probably essential to the good functioning of a community based on treaties and requiring mutual trust. The EU has indeed done a lot to promote liberal democracy in post-authoritarian and post-communist states. It is certainly true that the EU lacks effective mechanisms for enforcing liberal democracy in member states. In those respects, the conventional narrative is correct. But like most morality tales, the reality is far more complicated. Much of the conventional narrative is either wrong or seriously incomplete. In fact, the challenge to liberal democracy in Europe is both deeper and wider than the conventional narrative suggests. So where does this conventional narrative go wrong? First, the argument about liberal democratic values being inherent in the union's DNA is simply wrong. It is important to be clear about this because we cannot plan our future without knowing our past. The EU has always been more than a customs union, more than an economic club, that is true. But contrary to countless statements in recent decades, the EU has not always defined itself as a club of liberal democracies. In fact, not even as a club of democracies. The historical record, and I'm not inventing this, I have spent hundreds of hours in the archives of the European Parliament, the European Commission, the European Council, the French, Belgian, German uh, foreign ministries, and other archives. The historical record reveals that the norms defining eligibility for EU membership have changed considerably over time, sometimes as a result of intense political struggle. Now, I'm not gonna give you, in this brief part of my remarks, I'm not gonna give you the whole book version, but I just want to make, uh, make this point clear. In the Treaty of Paris and in the Treaty of Rome, it said very clearly, as you know, of course, any European state may apply to join. Democracy was not a criterion for membership. That was not because it was overlooked. That was not because they assumed somebody else would take care of it. The papers on the drafting of the Treaty of Rome show that the, the travaux préparatoires looked at the, the statute on the European political community. They looked at the statute of the Council of Europe, which said clearly, you must be a, a liberal democracy to join. And they chose not to include that. They chose not to include that in the Treaty of Paris and in the Treaty of Rome. Instead, there was a clear, informal, but clear understanding in that, those early years of the European community uh, that democracy was not a criterion for membership. Instead, there was a, an informal understanding that this new community was open to non-communist states. It's very different from our current understanding. In the late 1950s, Paris and Bonn, for very different reasons, encouraged Spain to pursue membership in the new community, despite the fact that, that uh, Franco was still in power. In 1961, as the community was negotiating with Turkey, about what became the Ankara Treaty, which was the first statement that Turkey's future lay as a member. While the community was negotiating the Ankara Treaty, there was a military coup in Ankara. The prime minister was shot, or hung, I don't remember, but he was dead by the end of that. The European community did not break off the negotiations with Turkey. It was the military junta in Ankara that stopped the negotiations. They sent a letter to Brussels, which I've read, which said, we're kind of busy here at the moment. We'll get back to you. 
Uh, at the end of 1961, there was a European parliamentary report, which people sometimes look at today, known as the Birkelbach Report, authored by a German uh, uh, parliamentarian, Willy Birkelbach. And that report, it was a report on enlargement, and it made what was at the time a radical proposal that only parliamentary democracies were eligible for membership. But its author, Birkelbach, and I spoke to him before he died about this, and I've read through his papers, he chose not to refer to human rights because he and his colleagues within the political committee of the, of the parliament believed that a reference to human rights was too radical, that it would not gain support for across the, the European Parliament. In 1962, the community finally told Spain that it was not eligible to join until it democratized. But only after Paris and Bonn backed down in the face of resistance from within the European Parliament and a unified mobilization by European trade unions. In 1967, following a military coup in Athens, the, the community did freeze its association treaty with Greece. And by 1970, the sort of norms that, were fam that we are familiar with today was established and explicit in the community, that you must be a parliamentary democracy that respects human rights. This little short history is important to, to highlight that the community was not born with these values. It developed these values. And by the mid-2000s, roughly 2005, 2006, those values, the commitment to those values began to weaken. The bottom line here is that the EU's commitment to liberal democracy is a development in the construction of Europe, one which I hope will endure, but it is not inevitable, and it could become just a passing chapter in our history. Second, the fragility of liberal democracy in today's EU is not largely a Polish-Hungarian problem, and it won't be fixed by measures that target individual states, however important those measures may be. Problems in Poland and Hungary are undeniably serious, but if we look further, we see the consensus on liberal democratic values is breaking down. National chauvinism and sovereignism are on the rise across the EU, both among masses and elites. In Germany and the Netherlands, non-liberal democratic parties routinely get 15 to 20 percent of the vote, depending on how you count. In France, the first round of the elections uh, a week or so ago showed more than 30 percent support for what I would argue are non-liberal democratic parties. In Italy, the Fratelli d'Italia party has risen from 18 percent to over 21 percent today in, in support. If you combine that with La Lega, whose liberal democratic credentials are certainly open to question, that's 40% in the polls in Italy. In Greece, neo-Nazis were frighteningly, frighteningly close to ruling the streets some years ago, and their ideological cousins in Sweden have been on the rise in recent years. In other words, there is an EU-wide problem that needs to be acknowledged before it can be addressed. So where does this problem come from? Even more uncomfortable, is it possible that the EU has actually contributed to the problem? My answer to that second question is yes. One aspect which shouldn't be ignored is that the EU's internal dynamics, political economy, and party system facilitate the weakening of liberal democracy. This unintended effect has several dimensions. EU resource transfers bolster the budgets of illiberal governments allowing them to reward their supporters and avoid reforms. EU membership itself reduces risks for foreign investors, which further reinforces illiberal regimes. E uh, European Parliament party groups tend to protect allied parties, even when they challenge or depart from liberal democratic values. And there are examples of this on the left and on the right. The free movement of persons creates a pressure valve for illiberal regimes, removing those who might otherwise stay home and insist on reforms. I just read the other day a survey of young Hungarians found that one-third of young Hungarians want to leave their country. So who's going to vote in future Hungarian elections? 
And finally, there's a slippery slope. As more member states move away, or I should say, as more member states embrace illiberal values and procedures, there's less shame and less pressure uh, for reform uh, within the union. This is referred to by uh, somebody who addressed the conference uh, recently, uh, the other day, Daniel, political scientist Daniel Kellerman. He calls this the autocracy trap. And addressing it, it's, it's very tricky. Addressing this without compromising other core values is not easy. But unfortunately, that's not the hardest problem we faced. We face. Liberal democracy is threatened by another aspect of the EU's DNA, one that lies deeper than its commitment to liberal democracy. And that is the EU's commitment to and promotion of globalization. Political economy tends not to get a lot of attention. I remember from my time in Brussels and I've from countless uh, EU studies conferences, uh, but I, I think the EU's commitment and promotion of globalization requires attention in the context of thinking about the future of liberal democracy. Europeanization is a part, is in part, a local version of globalization. Whether at European or global scale, this phenomenon has two dimensions. The elimination of barriers to the movement of goods, capital, and labor, and the transfer of decision-making authority to intergovernmental or supranational institutions that are quite removed from the familiar symbols and the democratic accountability of the nation state. And from its earliest days, European integration has involved reducing barriers and pooling sovereignty and, and decision-making authority in European institutions. That's why I say it is in part a local version of globalization. It's a lot more than that, but it is in part that. The world, and Europe included, tried to escape this I'm oh, sorry, Let me, I skipped an important point. I want to mention here the work of the economist Danny Roderick. Some of you may know his, his work. Danny Roderick gave us the concept of a political trilemma. It's not a dilemma, it's a trilemma. And Roderick's political trilemma says that democracy, national sovereignty, and globalization are mutually incompatible. You can have any two of those points, but you cannot have all three, is Roderick's argument. Now, the world, and Europe included, tried to escape this in the 1960s and 70s through a political compromise that scholars call embedded liberalism, where nations could reap the income gains of tariff reductions, which are indisputable. Reducing tariffs produces national income gains. Indisputable. They could reap those income gains while the welfare state protects their populations from the negative effects. And that was the, what, what we in political science call embedded liberalism. But starting in the 1980s, EU governments turned toward neoliberalism, exposing more and more people to the income inequality and the employment insecurity that comes from globalization parentheses, Europeanization. They did this within the EU by focusing the integration project on deepening the single market without investing equally in social protections. In fact, by trusting that the market would cure all ills. And they, the EU did this abroad by joining the United States and others in moving the world from the GATT to the WTO. The results of this policy choice are becoming clearer by the day. A growing gap between the attitudes of masses and elites, a polarization and radicalization of political opinion, a decline of political parties of the center left and center right, a mistrust of traditional media as reliable sources of information, a mistrust of national and international, in our case, European institutions, and a retreat to national chauvinism and national sovereignty. The fragility of liberal democracy in today's EU simply cannot be understood without this larger context. As I said at the outset, this is not a comforting tale. The challenge before us is as deep as it is complex. So bottom line, 
This is not to say that the developments in Poland and Hungary, for example, are, aren't troubling, nor that the Treaty on European Union uh, doesn't need to be, should not be amended, that they're fine the way they are. That's clearly not my point. But if we truly care about the future of liberal democracy in Europe, we cannot afford to be comforted by the conventional narrative. We cannot afford to focus on the symptoms while overlooking the disease. That's my point. Thank you. Thank you very much. I must say, I, I know now of one book that I'm going to buy after this conference <laughs> ends. But uh, before that, maybe we have one or two questions. Five minutes. Hi. Well, um, actually, actually, you said that you, you have been to uh, several par parliaments uh, across Europe. Uh, if Marine Le Pen is elected in France, uh, how do you see the future of democracy in France evolving uh, in the future? <laughs> yeah, prediction is a risky game. Um, well, actually, what I said is I've been to many archives to do the historical work, rather than I've been to many parliaments. Uh, I mean, we're all watching the French situation. Is it the Marine 1 or Marine 2 who will, if, if she is elected, who will rule? Um, but. Uh, I mean, her, her commitment to the, the supremacy of French law is, is, a, real, is a real challenge for, for the EU. Uh, but uh, I don't know, I really can't make a prediction because I don't know, like I said, is it the, the Marine Le Pen we saw 10 years ago? Is it the Marine Le Pen, when, um, you know, I got my voting uh, uh, papers the other day so I can vote in the second round and I read that and that's not the Marine Le Pen that we heard 10 years ago. So I really am hesitant to make a prediction. One more quick question. Uh, thank you. Uh, in face of the weakening of liberal democracies in the EU in recent years, uh, do you consider it problematic that countries like Turkey where there's been no visible improvement of the democratic values, but rather a decline to have them as long-standing candidate countries. I, I missed the end of your question. Do you see it as problematic to have them as long-standing candidate countries for EU membership? Well, I think the, the, the Turkish candidacy for membership is sort of a fiction that both sides maintain. Uh, I, I, honestly don't think uh, there are, uh, there's significant willingness within the EU and its member states now to, to, uh, to open the door to Turkey, even if Turkey were to, let's imagine the coup hadn't happened and there were crackdown after the coup hadn't happened. Uh, I don't think there's serious uh, desire in Europe to, to see Turkey as a member state. Uh, and I think we've seen the government in Ankara in recent years uh, uh, maintains the fiction, um, but but uh, has, is looking elsewhere. So I think that's, uh, both sides find it useful to maintain the fiction. Uh, for Europe, it's the, it's the migration deal, largely. Uh, and, and for Ankara, it's credits, it's a certain status, uh, but I think it's largely a fiction. Yeah. I think Carlos would want to ask one more question. He was waving. So thank you, thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. I may have a slightly methodological disagreement in the way you presented the narrative, particularly the historical point, because probably after 67, you couldn't really speak of uh, this lack of essential reference to liberal values within the European Union. And conditionality already was there since the early 70s, and we know that very well in, in Spain, Portugal, and Greece, and it worked up an important point there. But my, my question is precisely taken from that, uh, the learning, the learning mechanism that this is within the European Union. I think that will be the, the element I will emphasize. Rather than not being equal to ourselves in the 50s, we have learned a lot how to behave. And one of the things I would like you to elaborate is what we have learned about precisely conditionality. And there are people, some of them members of this consortium, that have argued that conditionality has been a relative failure. So we haven't been able to really shape uh, countries that seek to apply for members of the European Union uh, to become members respecting those kind of liberal values. 
And from here, I would like to take you to a very crucial uh, current topical issue, which is Ukrainian membership. And I would like to hear your reflections on how the European Union should behave in this case, because on the one hand, uh, we may understand the question of uh, urgency, but on the other hand, uh, I wonder what are your thoughts about softening conditionality in this very specific uh, case. Thank you. Well, clearly conditionality has been toughened again and again and again. Uh, and we've seen in a number of cases where it apparently was not, was not tough enough. But I, I think it's a bit unfair to focus just on the new member states who seem to be backsliding. Because what I was trying to emphasize was we have serious problems with liberal democracy in old member states including in some of the states that were assumed to be the best institutionalized, most transparent, most accountable democratic systems. Uh, so, so yes, I, I, I'm in favor of quite tough conditionality, but I think that has to be conditionality applied to, to all member states, not just to, the, not just to new member states. Uh, on your specific point about Ukraine, uh, I would be in favor of recognizing Ukraine as a candidate for membership. Uh, I think Ukraine has made a lot of progress in the, in the few years uh, prior, well, say the last, uh, last four or five years. Uh, it has a long way to go, but, but that, uh, that has been the case with many candidate states. Many states were recognized as candidates, but not yet considered ready for membership. And that's, I mean, the point I make in, in the book is I focus on eligibility for membership. Readiness for membership is a different decision. So there's one decision which was sort of taken at the Versailles summit uh, a few weeks ago where they sort of said, okay, we're going to, we're going to ask the commission to, to give an advice. That's, it was a first step toward recognizing the eligibility of Ukraine. Uh, in, in a few weeks, I expect they will complete that process and recognize Ukraine as a candidate. I believe that makes sense. Uh, given the progress that Ukraine has made, but I would not weaken the, uh, the, the next step, which is the requirements for becoming a member state. And then that raises interesting questions of whether the EU should have some sort of like associate membership status. I mean, there are different ideas floating around. Uh, so I would say yes to candidacy. I would hold the line on, on membership and, and continue to hold all member states' feet to the fire on liberal democracy. Thank you very much. OK, now it's time for me to vacate my seat and, and leave it to, to Axel, who is uh, Deputy Director at the uh, Leuven Center. But maybe this is now a, a good time when you're coming up just to, to say that this is, well, this is not the first consortium that I've been involved in, but it's by, by far the, the, the biggest one, the largest one with the most participants. And I think I will speak for many of us when we say that we've admired the way that you work and we've admired the way you've kept the group together and actually uh, gathered all the recommendations uh, and, and the report. Uh, it's been fantastic. And now you will talk about uh, the future of ReConnect and the legacy that it leaves uh, to all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, baby. And before we go into a coffee break, and also after very interesting discussions, we want to take a brief opportunity to introduce to you some of, let's say, the things which will remain after ReConnect officially ends. This is the final conference and officially the project uh, will end end of April, uh, but the project does not die in a way. And we try to develop different types of tools which will keep the project alive, but most importantly, which will keep the research results alive, and we hope we will also keep the debate alive. And in order to do that, we want to briefly show you and make you aware of some of the things which will continue for the project, which are online resources which we have produced, a massive open online course, a MOOC on rule of law and democracy in the European Union, which will be presented by my colleague Maike, and then finally, which you already saw when you entered the room, the different info sheets for young European citizens, which we developed based on the research of ReConnect to try to connect to young citizens and also make them aware of the challenges uh, the European Union is confronted with and to make them knowledge 
uh, about the core concepts um, of the project. Very quickly on the online tools. Uh, Reconnect, as you know, is a European project, and European projects produce a lot of research reports, research results, uh, papers, and, and so on. And we will try to keep all these elements, all these papers, online available. And you see here what we produced in the last uh, 48 months. It will not stop here. Many people are still publishing, but especially the 59 reports will remain publicly available, open for everybody, and they are really the testimony of the rich research which has been done. We have organized many events, virtual, not only due to COVID. We were doing that before COVID because we believe that webinars and online tools are very helpful to keep the debate going and to really enable people also to watch some of the discussions after the, the live event took place. And we had webinars on specific issues like rule of law conditionality, but we also organized webinar series on democracy and rule of law backsliding, not only in Europe, but in other parts of the world. We had a webinar series on the conference on the future of the European Union, and we had several high-level uh, public uh, uh, lectures which touched upon the core concepts and the core ideas of, of the projects. They remain available, and we will see, and we see when we uh, follow who is watching them, that a lot of people are still going back to these resources to also uh, uh, enter the discussion. Then finally, we have a very rich series of blogs, and the blog series which we developed is actually, on the one hand, a means for reconnect to really, in a very concise way, try to convey the key messages which we found in the research, but also to discuss ongoing and topical issues as they were happening uh, uh, in, in, in the course of the project. And these blogs will also remain available and uh, online. All this is pulled together on our website, so I really encourage you all to visit our website and to really also consult all the rich material. That's only one part, that's the online resources. I now give the floor to Maike to present our massive open online course, which will also still run for a couple of years. Maike, you can come here. Hi everyone, thank you Axel for the introduction. Um, I will now shortly present the Reconnect MOOC to you. Um, so the Reconnect MOOC is a massive open online course on rule of law and democracy in Europe. And it is one of the ways in which Reconnect has tried to engage with EU and non-EU citizens on all matters concerning the European Union, democracy and the rule of law. And as you can see on the slide, um, the main goals of the massive open online course uh, were to educate and engage with citizens on a number of topics, um, like for example, their general understanding of the EU, the concepts of democracy and the rule of law, the EU institutions and what their roles and tools are in the democracy and rule of law crisis, and then also the main challenges faced by democracy and the rule of law in some key EU policy areas like trade or migration or COVID-19. The target audience of our MOOC uh, are EU and non-EU citizens of all ages and all educational levels. It is an introductory course, so it can basically be followed by anyone, anywhere, anytime. Then um, the MOOC is run on the edX platform and it has had two successful runs so far, and we are currently on our third run. Um, after the end of the project, to keep on engaging with citizens, we will also do a fourth run and maybe even a fifth run. Um, as you can see, the first run was an instructor-based run, meaning that learners had to follow the MOOC at a fixed pace, and one module would go live each week, and then they would have to complete that module before moving on to the next one. But the second, the third, and the fourth run are all self-paced MOOCs, meaning that the course material is available for a long period of time and that they can follow the course at their own pace. Uh, when they have completed all of the materials, so when they have done all the exercises and the final exam, they can also receive an official MOOC certificate. 
Um, now, the MOOC in numbers. So, over the course of three runs, we have been able to achieve 4,170 learners, um, but this number is still rising every day. And in total, these learners represent 99 countries worldwide, uh, which means that our MOOC is reaching citizens far beyond the borders of the EU. Um, and you can see that the top five countries of registration are slightly different for each run. So in the first run, most of our learners were based in Belgium, the UK, Turkey, the US, and the Netherlands. Uh, but in the second run, we managed to reach a lot of people in Poland, then Belgium, the UK, the US, and Italy. And in the third run, it was once again Belgium, uh, the UK, Turkey, the US, and Italy. In terms of gender, our learner base is predominantly female with 60.8%. 38% .8%. Um, was male and 1.2% identified as other. And the median learner age is 26. So we uh, mainly reach very young citizens of um, the European Union and beyond the European Union. Union. Then uh, the MOOC consists of six modules and a final exam, and each module is composed of various videos, exercises, discussion sessions, and testimonials. And the main focus on the MOOC is to create interaction uh, between citizens, but also between citizens and the project, and citizens and the EU. Um, and you can see on the slide one of the um, discussion assignments um, that is present in the MOOC. So we would, for example, ask learners, um, according to you, how could the EU strengthen its identity in the future? And then they can reflect on this question and debate amongst themselves um, in the discussion forum. And of course, the MOOC also features a lot of experts of the Reconnect Consortium, many of whom are present in the room right now. So we really have a distinguished set of instructors um, for all of the videos in the MOOC. And I think that was all on the MOOC already, so I will now pass the floor to Yelinda to give us some more information on the info sheets. So, uh, while entering here, you might all have seen the uh, educational materials. There are two copies. One is for uh, uh, it's a collection of the info sheets for younger children, and the other one is a collection of the 10 info sheets for older students. But what are these info sheets? So, um, um, we were, since the, since the beginning, um, uh, while developing the project as such, uh, which is about reconciling uh, EU citizens with the EU institutions, we were uh, thinking about which citizens. So. Is it older people? So um, after, let's say, adults, or is it also um, uh, children? So um, and and then during the uh, duration of the project, at, se at several points, we were asked to uh, do more about delivering uh, the message of what is the EU, what is the what are the EU institutions doing, what is their role, what do they promote to different ages. So uh, Reconnect has developed info sheets for students for primary and secondary school to help them uh, learn more about the core values and the key topics of interest of the project, but uh, which include, uh, therefore, the EU, uh, what is democracy, what are human rights, what is the rule of law, children's rights, migration, climate change, and others. Um, these were developed the way these were developed was uh, in collaboration between the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law and uh, KU Leuven, uh, with the involvement of a, of a designer uh, that managed to uh, make the text more um, appealing to uh, younger ages. Um, so this was the idea of targeting a uh, younger generation of, uh, uh, of Europeans and young people living in the EU through the production of these educational materials. So we see these as a series of educational materials that are the primary vehicle for youth engagement um, in the Re Reconnect project. Um, and in involving younger citizens in discussions about the European Union, uh, the meaning and uh, the importance of the core concepts of and core values of the EU, such as the rule of law and democracy. So depending on reading, readability, on, uh, re reading ability, 
The info sheets are, uh, can be read by students independently or, or also serve as a basis for discussion in schools. So uh, with a teacher leading a class discussion and therefore um, they uh, can be used in this version. They are also downloadable uh, online, both in PDF versions, but also um, uh, on, they can be accessed on the, on the website. And um, sorry, I completely forgot about the. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm right here. Um, so uh, we have produced 10 info sheets, uh, two different age groups. Uh, 9 to 11 and 12 to 6, which are reflected in the two, uh, uh, in these two uh, printouts for younger children and for older students. Um, and I have already mentioned the, uh, the focus. Uh, what I haven't mentioned until now is that, uh, which is related to what I was saying earlier about the usage of this, um, of, the, of the info sheet, they can be used um, they can be read independently by, by, um, um, by those who are interested, but they can also be used in class. And therefore, uh, on top of the specific info sheets for um, younger children and older students, there is also a set of guidance notes for educators, which includes um, um, guidance on how the materials can be used. It includes questions for discussion in, class, in classrooms. It also includes a list of links or videos that can be used as additional material um, in classrooms. So on the content, we have um, tried to, so in, in the selection of the 10 topics, we made a distinction between the core concepts that are related to the project, which include what is the uh, EU, what are my rights as an EU citizen, what are human rights, what is the rule of law and what is democracy, and then thematic issues, which as I mentioned before, relate to uh, the, rights of the, or the rights of children, um, migration, what is the EU doing uh, about migration, climate change, um, use of media and especially uh, online security and uh, education and training. So um, we, because uh, of time limitation, uh, I won't have the time to go into the substance of each of the 10 topics, but you have the, uh, the printouts uh, in front of you. Uh, I just wanted to give you a couple of um, uh, examples of uh, uh, what uh, these educational materials contain. For instance, what is the European Union? It's the first topic. Um, we explain that uh, in a simple language that the EU is a group of 27 member countries. The EU stands for European Union. Uh, the EU operates a little bit, we say, like a country, so it has its own values, it has a flag, it has a bank, a central bank, it has its banknotes and coins and uh, a parliament and a court. Um, and all the citizens of the member countries are also EU citizens, and they are called EU citizens. Uh, someone was asking, how did you test this? Well, my colleagues uh, at the Bingham Center, they tested it with their kids. Uh, they fall within the, the different age groups. I tested them through um, the kids of a friend who are not uh, English native speakers. So that was an additional uh, test that um, made it possible for us to simplify the language uh, to the level that uh, the, what the substance wasn't, uh, uh, the substance still remained there. So then something else that is addressed in this first uh, info sheet, how was the EU created? Uh, um, or uh, I, I've given there an example of uh, the info sheets, or what, what are the EU values? Um, there is a list of EU values that is explained in the info sheet. It explains what is human dignity, why, why is that relevant, what is freedom, democracy, the rule of law, etc. There are other topics also that are included in the info sheet, um, which is um, how can the rule of law help us? 
So why is it relevant on um, on a um, daily basis? How is the rule of law important in the uh, EU? I've uh, picked up another topic, uh, which is the fourth uh, uh, topic that is discussed in this series of info sheets, which is what is the rule of law um, that is relevant to the, uh, it's, it's a core idea related to the project. So, um, for instance, in this case, we explain um, uh, that the rule of law is one of the key values on which the European Union is based, but then trying to uh, make it more concrete for, for children, we uh, explain this um, uh, with the um, symbol or the paradigms of, uh, of a football match, where it is important that there are rules, that all rules are applied equally to both, um, to, to both teams, uh, that if something, uh, if, if there is a, a, a wrong done by one of the parties, then people can revert to, the, uh, to someone who will make a decision whether uh, that was there was actually something that uh, um, went wrong or not. And so we uh, illustrate the concept through the football metaphor, uh, and this is more clearly than um, uh, detailed in the um, in the in the info sheet. Um, still, uh, for instance, um, how uh, how is the rule of law important in the European Union? And we explain this then through examples going through the uh, different um, elements of the rule of law: access to justice, legal certainty, legality, um, prohibition, so uh, elimination of arbitrariness, etc. The third topic and the final topic that I wanted to mention in this case is what is democracy? Once again, we tried to explain this in, uh, uh, in an accessible manner for the different uh, age groups, uh, also going through the um, etymology of the word, uh, people power, ruled by the people, demos and kratos, uh, including also quick facts about uh, each of the topics in order to make it more uh, clearer, but also something that can be remembered by uh, children of the different age groups. Thanks a lot. Uh, Thank you. So for all of you who are interested, the documents are outside, and now we really uh, offer you a nice coffee outside, and we reconvene here at 3.30. See you at 3.30. Thank you. Human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights are the cornerstones on which the European Union is built. Or so proclaims the EU treaty. Yet these fundamental values appear rather fragile under the pressure of issues like the COVID-19 pandemic, migration and the financial crisis, especially the democratic and rule of law standards in several EU member states find themselves on shaky grounds. Meanwhile, the Union is also in the midst of a legitimacy crisis, resulting in a growing sense of disconnection with its citizens. How can the European Union tackle all of these unprecedented challenges? What measures could it take to continue to live up to the expectations of the people it seeks to unite? As part of Reconnect, a Horizon 2020 research project, this MOOC examines these crucial and very contemporary issues. From a democracy and rule of law point of view, we navigate the complex context that is the European Union, trying to understand the underlying problems and even lift the veil on possible ways to turn Europe's narrative towards reconciliation. Leading academic experts and practitioners explain how the EU has been dealing with these challenges so far and whether that approach has delivered. 
We also share testimonies from people at the center of these dynamics, offering their first-hand insights from the field. By listening to this diverse range of voices and perspectives, you will acquire the knowledge to understand some of the key political developments of our time and learn how Reconnect aims to help ensure a future for the European Union based on its fundamental values and driven by its citizens. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm here now in a different role, uh, chairing a panel um, discussion about the roadmap uh, for rebuilding citizens' trust uh, in the context of reflecting on the uh, future of Europe, uh, which uh, indeed includes the conference on the future of Europe, but not only, as we've already seen there, uh, many challenges on the table. Um, we have many speakers, so what I'm going to do is just very briefly uh, mention the order in which I will allow them to speak for five minutes each. Um, um, and then, uh, hopefully, if we manage to stay within time, uh, we have sufficient time to, for a Q&A, for discussion, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, the order uh, I, I suggest is uh, we start with uh, Birgit van Halt, uh, UN Human Rights Office. Um, then uh, Paivi uh, Leno Sandberg, Helsinki University, uh, Marlene Wind, University of Copenhagen, um, Julia Fernandez Arribas, Equipo Europa, who is over there, uh, Konstantin Schaefer, University of Münster in IFOC, uh, Carlos Closa, Spanish National Research Council, School of Transnational Governance, and then finally Alberto Alamano um, from Paris. Um, so, Without further ado, I would like to give the word to Birgit. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, distinguished panel members, uh, dear participants. I would like to commend all the partners of the Connect project, and in particular, the coordinator, Professor Jan Wouters. It is really a great pleasure for me to be with you today. And much of what you will hear me say resonates greatly with what I just heard in the last two hours that I was with you about the recommendations of the project. So as the UN Human Rights Office, we have this terrible acronym OHCHR, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. We are witnessing a rollback of and a questioning of the values that are enshrined in the, in the charter in the UN Charter and in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. At the same time, we are witnessing a growing disaffect for institutions and multilateral organizations. The two trends are distinct, <coughs> but also interconnected. And the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has long warned of a breakdown in trust that is leading to a breakdown in values. The key question is how to reverse this trend. And I would like to offer three suggestions that are inspired by our common agenda of the Secretary General and the call to action for human rights. First, we need to go back to the basics, namely the opening words of the UN Charter, we the people. Too many people in the EU suffer socioeconomic deprivation and struggle to make ends meet. As inequality continues to rise, the disenfranchised have become indifferent, lost faith in democracy, and or become vulnerable to conspiracy theories or calls from extremist parties. To restore trust in institutions, we need a renewed social contract that treats employment, health, education, and housing as human rights and not as services. Ensuring quality employment, fair wages, closing social protection gaps, addressing homelessness, much remains to be delivered. The Sustainable Development Agenda uses the term 
leaving no one behind, LNOB. And we need to start with those who are most behind first. This also means tackling discrimination head on, not only individual, but also structural and institutional forms of discrimination and historical grievances must be addressed. The EU has been making significant efforts in this area, but it suffices to look around the room to notice that we have much to do in the area of diversity and representation. This is not about asking for privileged treatment for some groups of people, but it's about removing barriers so that persons with disabilities, the Roma, people of Arab and African descent, LGBTIQ persons, and other minorities can access their human rights on an equal footing with the majority population and can meaningfully participate in decision-making processes. It is also about discontinuing discriminatory practices such as segregation in housing and education and the institutionalization of older persons and persons with disabilities. The EU has the responsibility and the power to encourage states to move in the right direction and should, move, should lead by example. Secondly, we have to strengthen meaningful participation in decision-making processes. A healthy civic space is essential for open and informed discussions about the future that we want <coughs> and the future in which we want the EU to go. Without free and pluralistic media, public opinion can be easily manipulated and hatred propagated. Important initiatives are being taken by the EU to promote media freedom, protect journalists, and counter slaps. But more needs to be done to nurture and protect media freedom and civic space. Promising practices, by the way, have been documented by the EU Fundamental Rights Agency in its research on civic space just <coughs> recently. To bridge the gap between people and institutions, we must also enhance consultation with civil society and move the discussion or bring the discussion closer to the people by mobilizing local governments, cities, civil society, academia, and national parliaments. Our office's guidelines on the right to participate in public affairs could serve as a source of inspiration. The European Year of Youth should further be used to strengthen youth participation in general and young people's participation in political life in particular. And our Secretary General has proposed a Youth in Politics Index to track youth participation in political life. Thirdly, we need more accountability. Accountability is a prerequisite for reconciling people with their leaders and their institutions. When justice is slow, when police brutality is not sanctioned, when corruption remains unaddressed, and when executive measures <coughs> overreach, the divide becomes greater. The EU's rule of law review cycle is an important initiative, as we've also heard from the speakers, but we need a more open and inclusive debate on how to address the problems. This requires more transparency and more participatory political discussions, starting with the peer review process in the Council of the EU. Let me conclude where I started. Europe, as we often say, is not an island. It exists in the world. And the values that the EU is built on, or that it has acquired or has developed, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, are not only European values. They are universal values. And more than ever, the EU and the UN must work together to reconnect people and institutions at all levels with these shared values. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's always important to be reminded that Europe is not an island uh, and is in, uh, embedded in a larger context. Um, so we move on to uh, Paivi Leno Sandberg, Professor of Transnational European Law, University of Helsinki, uh, also Director of the Master's Program in Global uh, Governance Law, and Deputy Director of the Eric Kasten Institute of International Law and Human Rights. Uh, and of course also, uh, and a very important member of the, uh, the Reconnect 
consortium. So please uh, go Thank ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, let me begin by saying that I think one of the most fantastic things about the Re uh, Reconnect project has been that it's actually looked at rule of law beyond the courts. Uh, and as uh, a transparency researcher, I'm of course delighted that the four final recommendations concern uh, transparency and access to documents. So of course, I have to talk about that. So I talk about that as a, as a researcher who does research on transparency, but also as an end user in the sense that I make a lot of uh, these requests uh, for information. And uh, when I get denials, I'm very angry. Uh, and from time to time, I also appeal them. So uh, these are two uh, real life experiences experiences that I, that I thought I could maybe share. And I think based on, on sort of many years of, of trying to get my hands on information, I think there is a general argument or experience that flows from those experiences. And that argument is this. Um, I feel uh, that uh, the EU institutions basically often fail to see that the treaty provisions on participatory democracy actually have real life meaning. And that uh, instead, as citizens, we're very often sort of allocated time slots somewhere in the procedure uh, when we're allowed uh, to make our opinions and voices heard. But then in other times, uh, it's better that we are quiet. Um, and those times, of course, concern uh, elections to the parliament, uh, consultations and so forth. But my interest in influencing is broader <laughs> than this. Um, and for some time ago, um, uh, I'm work also working on environmental uh, democracy and, and access to environmental information. I made a request, as it happened uh, at the same time with an NGO called Client Earth, uh, to a legal service opinion concerning uh, the reform of the Aarhus regulation, so on uh, access to environmental information. And what the council replied to me was that the arguments we were making about uh, the importance of democracy, access to documents, uh, access to justice, actually uh, were very worrisome because in their view, uh, actually what we wanted to uh, have, basically have access to information while decision making is ongoing, actually gives rise to, and I quote, external interference. Uh, and the justification was that um, this regulation, which actually concerns the rights of civil society uh, in, in this policy-making area, uh, they had been running campaigns uh, concerning reform in this area. Uh, and this was a problem, uh, because as a result of my interest and the interest of civil society, there was actually, and I quote, a reasonable risk that the decision to be taken would be substantially affected as a result of that pressure. And of course, to me, that raises a lot of questions about how the institutions understand democracy. Isn't that what debate during uh, the process is supposed to be about? That it may actually have the implications for the outcome uh, of the process. Needless to say, we have both appealed the decision it's pending before the general court. Um, Another thing that I want to raise is that there is a lot of fuss now about uh, legislative transparency that has been recently addressed by the General Court, uh, by the European Ombudsman, many, many times. And there are good reasons for that, because already uh, during the past Parliament and the Commission, um, there was an um, interinstitutional agreement on better regulation, which basically said uh, by the end of 2016, we should have a joint database. Uh, that makes it possible to follow legislative files and know where they are in the pipeline and which documents are available so as to know uh, and how to uh, influence things while they're happening. So uh, last week I wrote to the European Parliament and I said um, I'm interested in knowing which trialogues are currently ongoing because I'm also very interested in the Fit for 55 package and I would want to know where we are uh, in that area. Uh, the reply I got was that uh, there is no website um, that would indicate commission proposals under the ordinary legislative procedure that have ongoing trialogues. However, if I'm interested in knowing uh, where legislative negotiations are ongoing, I can try to construct a list, and that means that I can go to the uh, legislative observatory and then I was given some advice on which filters uh, to use. There were three of them. Uh, by applying them, I was told I would end up with 151 potential files in trialogues. But each of these would need to be checked, and I quote, need to be checked individually. 
because I would first need to find whether there is actually a committee in the parliament that has approved a mandate. Following this, I quote, you would need to check individually for each of the results of this exercise, whether the council has a mandate. Um, and of course, good luck with finding uh, that information. And then of course, even many of the files that would be appearing on this list actually are not being negotiated because the files are blocked. Uh, and on this, unfortunately, there is no public information. Uh, so then I was told, we hope the provided information is helpful for you. Well, it was not. Uh, and of course, I think this tells us a lot about uh, the state of <laughs> democratic lawmaking in the EU. And this is my final point, I'm coming to the end. And I think as lawyers, we're very often very keen to think that when there is a problem, the problem is with the law and we have to fix the law. Uh, but I think in this area, what we see very often is that the law is actually quite good. I mean, the EU uh, treaty rules on democracy, access to documents, they're quite good. But it's just that the institutions don't like them. Um, and it's, so, it's a problem uh, of attitude. Uh, and in that sense, changing the law will not help very much. What we need to change is the institutional attitude, which is very difficult. I want, that is ongoing. We, of course, as academics, have a job to do because we have to ask and insist on that information. The wheels of justice are slow. Uh, I have a case that has been pending for three and a half years. Um, so it takes time. Um, but uh, without that effort, I think uh, we will be left <clears throat> without a lot of information that is uh, necessary for the EU to develop towards a more democratic union. That's where I leave it. Thanks. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for this uh, important call for transparency and access to, uh, to information. Uh, we go to our next speaker, Marlene Wind, University of Copenhagen, uh, Professor and Director of the Center of European Politics and Professor of Law at i uh, Center of Excellence at the Faculty of Law, both uh, University of Copenhagen. And it's perhaps useful to mention a recent book which is called The Tribalization of Europe, a Defense of Our Liberal Values. And I suppose uh, your intervention will uh, relate to this. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Paul, and, uh, and thank you so much for, for inviting me to this uh, um, fantastic uh, concluding conference. I think I should start by admitting that I was actually part of another uh, consortium that lost to you. Uh, so I remember, uh, I remember years back you winning and us losing. Uh, I think you, you have done such a, a fantastic job, so I, I don't regret it today, only slightly perhaps. Um, so, um, um, I would like to talk about, um, yes, with the point of departure in my book, but also in other things I've been doing, um, actually the um, partly m something about um, uh, populism, but also about how we can and must create a better measure of, um, of backsliding democracies. Uh, and I think we need to be incredibly aware that backsliding uh, in democracies is different from backsliding in non-democracies. Uh, and if you look at Freedom House and all these uh, institutions that actually man monitor this, um, uh, they mix everything together. Uh, and I think that um, you need to make a distinction because the way it happens in democracies is actually very, very different. And I think we are only realizing that uh, in these years. But let me just start out, because I was so provoked by Daniel Thomas's otherwise really brilliant uh, talk uh, about uh, the narrative of, of uh, rule of law in Europe. I mean, I can't recognize really uh, a lot of the stuff you said I could really recognize and relate to. But the point about us believing that the rule of law was always there, no. Uh, what I teach my students, and I also wrote in my book, uh, is that um, uh, the, the Council of Europe was taking care of that when the EU was established, uh, and uh, it was a high, to, to a high degree uh, a bottom-up process with the uh, federal court in, in, in Germany asking in the Solange cases for uh, the, the EU to establish some rule of law. So, so I don't think we take it for granted. I think actually that one of the reasons why we are so concerned with it these years is that um, we simply cannot accept that, um, that we were not good enough when we extended Europe um, 
to um, eight, eight, ten new members that we had not done enough to make sure that conditionality is there when you apply, but not when you're inside. Um, and, uh, but I do agree with you absolutely that, um, that uh, this is a much larger problem also in other European uh, states, and here is where I come to populism. Because one of the points I'm trying to make in my book uh, is exactly that um, um, the breakdown of the rule of law started in the West and not in the East. What do I mean by that? It's rather provocative, I know. Uh, but I think that even though we did have Orban before Trump, um, I think that Trump, Brexit, uh, and um, a lot of the questioning of um, EU law supremacy came from Western European countries, including my own, I would say. Um, I think it's very important to, to realize that the whole wave of populism that we saw with, um, uh, with, um, uh, with Trump, Brexit, and, and everything else uh, was to a large extent uh, invented in the West, uh, perhaps inspired to some extent by what happened in, in Hungary, uh, but the illiberalism uh, was uh, also a Western invention in many ways. Uh, and I think that what we experienced those years um, uh, was also a, uh, not only a failure by politicians to act uh, on this, it was in many ways, at least over some years, there was this consensus also among Western intellectuals, um, at least that's my take on it, uh, that, well, they were elected. What's your problem? Realize it. Get, get, get real. Accept that um, Trump was elected uh, and that Brexit happened, people voted, the people have spoken. Shut up. You know, so that was at least my own personal experience that every time I tried to make an argument about how problematic all of this was, I was just told, why, why don't you just realize that, that you are, you know, the elite and uh, people want things differently and uh, grow up. Um, so, uh, uh, so I think that there was uh, <clears throat> Some years at least now, maybe things are changing now with what's happening in Ukraine and, and the EU, you know, starting to reflect more about what does it really mean to be a liberal democracy. Um, uh, but uh, I think there were some years where it was very, very hard to, uh, you know, to, to actually speak up against this. Um, also because our conception of democracy in Western Europe have changed over the years. Uh, it might be that we had this idea of constitutional democracy in many countries, uh, beyond Europe as well. Um, but we increasingly saw, and I think I can feel a little bit of that as well in your project with you know, participatory democracy and so on. I think that we had a tendency of changing our view of democracy to being, okay, if there's a vote on something, it's democracy. And it's more democratic the people vote on something than uh, rep representative politicians take a decision. Um, and uh, I think we have seen that in, 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 uh, in, in many uh, places, and it's very hard to argue against, right? Uh, and uh, I think we should argue against it. I, th I come from a country where we have elections or uh, referenda all the time. It's bad. It's really bad. It destroys uh, the, the dialogue, it destroys the discourse, and it's always about who's lying. Who's lying to whom? It's not about what we're actually going to vote on. Um, I also think there's a big uh, problem in the sense that we have this idea that, uh, okay, so we have constitutional democracies, we have courts, we can access the courts, we can we can complain, but we actually do have some countries in Europe, including my own, where courts play absolutely zero role. We do not have judicial review. Um, Sweden and Finland also didn't have that for until recently. Um, and uh, the UK, uh, this idea that the, the, the parliament rules uh, and that courts should not interfere. Uh, I think we have we have not been aware of that and the differences that Europe also contains. And it's not, it's not rare that I meet politicians from Hungary and Poland telling me, oh, 
we are so inspired by what you're doing in Denmark with, uh, you know, having courts that never interfere and, you know, it's the parliament that decides and if we have a majority, that's really great. Um, so, uh, unintentionally, at least, uh, we have the situation. So we need to be very, very careful in terms of how we distinguish between different types of democracy. Uh, Kim Lane Schiepler told me uh, at, a, at a webinar I was at uh, presenting where she was commenting um, a month ago or something, that, uh, oh, what you just have in Denmark is, is democracy without courts. And I was thinking, wow, yeah. Uh, uh, that's a very nice way of putting it. Uh, you could also say uh, that we have majoritarian democracy and it's considered to be the best in the world. Um, I got an email this morning about whether I wanted to sign a petition about the uh, for, uh, Europe, Europe, uh, European Federation because of what's happening in, in, um, uh, in Ukraine and, and the reluctance to do something about it among European politicians. Uh, but I can assure you that the 1st of June in Denmark, there'll be a referendum on the opt-out of our defense opt-out. Uh, and that will definitely be no thank you if there's anybody who speaks about a federation. Uh, so um, I'm just trying to, to, to sort of say that, yeah, um, populism is, is really still out there and we are not even aware of how we are co-producing it uh, as academics by not speaking up, by not being clear about the terms we are using. And a single point, because I know time is running out, is uh, some, recent, uh, uh, some recent research I have been doing um, and which is pointing a little bit more forward than my uh, criticism and anger that I'm uh, expressing here. Um, and that is uh, autocratic legalism. It's a term invented by Kim Lynn Schiepler. Well, not invented, but she's using it. Um, and um, I think that it tells us a lot about how democracies have been destroyed in Europe. How uh, cynical leaders, I know there's a lot of economic explanations of inequality and all that, but we also have an identity political turn um, going on right now where cynical leaders are using the law. First, they, they do two things. First step, they create a us and them. You know, we are the good guys, you are the bad guys. That's the first step. Create an enemy, do a narrative that creates this enemy. Okay, so when you're there, you have captured the media uh, by a majority because that's fine. Uh, then you start using the law against democracy. And it's very, very difficult for the EU or any other monitoring institution to, uh, to even find out that this is going on because if it happens within the law, then how do you measure it? How do you, how do you, how do you even register that this is happening? And this is a very specific type of backsliding that goes on in already established democracies. And this is something I think we need to take more seriously in Europe. And we need to develop a, a measurement tool that can take into account this kind of backsliding. Uh, I have done a small, you can't see it of course, but uh, in doing this research, I, tr I simply, uh, you know, statistically measured or, or looked at how different indices uh, look at the same countries and their democratic soundness uh, uh, over the same time period. And what, what we found out in this project was that, uh, you know, polity, they don't, they don't even see, a, you know, a backsliding going on. Uh, uh, and uh, Freedom House, very reluctantly and only very recently, uh, and uh, then we have the VDEM project in, in, uh, in Sweden that uh, where uh, backsliding, uh, and wh which are much more sensitive to, to this kind of, of mechanisms Sorry, of way. autocratic legalism. And that, Martin, yes, okay. they started uh, registering uh, this um, at a much earlier point. So that would be my suggestion for the future. Let's not be naive, let's wake up, let's defend democracy and build some tools that can actually uh, show when uh, backsliding is happening. Thanks. And sorry. Thank you so much. <clears throat>
Uh, so, sorry for interrupting. I, I, I do hope at least that Reconnect contributed a little bit to this, uh, <laughs> to this fight, let's call it like that. Um, we move on to uh, um, uh, the next speaker, and I think we're uh, more explicitly going to address uh, the whole context of this ongoing conference on the future of Europe, which has been uh, ongoing since last uh, year, May, um, with uh, Julia Fernandez Arribas of uh, Equipo Europa, an um, organization you co-founded, a Spanish pro-European uh, pro European youth organization. She's, by the way, also a member of the high-level advisory group of the conference observatory of the conference on the future of Europe, and you wrote a, uh, or, uh, or contributed, I suppose, a pretty uh, critical report on the ongoing conference. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, you also hold a since, since this year, I suppose, a BA, a dual BA in law, political science, and public administration of the Universitat Autonoma de Madrid. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I will briefly discuss uh, three points, uh, which are, first of all, um, why the European Union has certain structural or institutional limitations. Second of all, how these limitations have led to a um, decline in the European Union's legitimacy. And thirdly and finally, how can we strengthen the European Union's legitimacy by um, way of uh, the participatory democracy in the European Union. Um, the crisis that the European Union has to tackle has, has had to tackle in the recent uh, decade or so have uh, highlighted the institutional and structural deficiencies of the European Union. We have seen that it presents a certain, or it lacks, more uh, best to say, certain tools and powers in order to be able to properly uh, tackle or handle this crisis that it has faced. And this is a consequence that the lack of these powers has led uh, to um, the citizens' perception that the European Union has not sufficiently or properly handled this crisis. The problem is that the European Union's legitimacy is mostly based or mostly understood as an output legitimacy. This is its capacity to deliver. And precisely because in the recent decade, the European Union, as perceived by citizens, has not been able to deliver properly, uh, the, the consequence of these limitations has been that the, the legitimacy of the European Union has declined. To prevent this issue from becoming existential for the European Union, we need to outsource the legitimacy of the European Union. We need to shift the focus from the output legitimacy of the European Union to the input legitimacy of the European Union um, by creating a, a permanent mechanism uh, of citizens' participation or by strengthening this uh, participatory dim dimension of the European Union. The Conference on the Future of Europe is an example on how to do this uh, because it precisely involves citizens in a way in the decision-making process of the European Union. But this endeavor, this endeavor of strengthening the European Union's participatory dimension should not be understood as a one-time thing, mm -hmm. which is at the end of the day what the Conference on the Future of Europe is, but rather as a permanent thing. And that is why I myself um, bet on the creation of a permanent mechanism uh, for citizens' participation in the EU. But how can we do this? How can we create a permanent participatory mechanism at the EU level? Uh, well, as Paul said, um, I am part of the high-level advisory group on the Conference on the Future of Europe. And we recently uh, put forward four proposals on different ways in which these mechanisms could be developed. Because of time constraints, I will not get into all of them. But I would like to present two of them that I personally think are really, really relevant and should be considered as possible outcomes of the Conference on the Future of Europe. One of them is to create a big tent fora on the European Union's strategic uh, priorities. As you know, every five years, the European Union defines its uh, new priorities, but strategic priorities, but citizens have no say whatsoever on these priorities. They are completely left out on the definition of what the European Union will do during the next five years. We think that this should no longer be the case, and so every every time an election is, um, is going to happen again, the five months prior to the election, uh, there should be a European citizens panel should be held in which randomly selected citizens can de deliber deliberate on which these priorities should be. And this deliberation should inform the final decision by the European Commission. And secondly, uh, one of uh, the other proposals that we put forward is holding European citizens deliberation in conjunction with European conven conventions. As stated right now in the treaties, unfortunately, European citizens don't play any, 
any role in the, in the development of European conventions. And this is truly a pity because it's precisely when foundational moments take, take place that by involving citizens we can promote uh, the European public sphere or we can promote the development of European identity. So by involving citizens in European conventions we could truly achieve what's precisely what we're searching after, strengthening European le uh, legitimacy or the European Union's democratic legitimacy by involving citizens in the decision-making process. So um, to sum it up, uh, my very brief intervention, um, we need to tackle the European Union's uh, institutional and structural limitations, and if not by treaty reform, which is not as easy as we would like it to be, by strengthening the other source of potential uh, legitimacy of the EU, which is, which is its input legitimacy. And if the Conference on the Future of Europe leads to the creation of a permanent mechanism uh, of participation of, of citizens, then I believe it will have been worthwhile. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this and also for sticking so well to the time limit. Um, <laughs> we're moving uh, to the next speaker, Konstantin Schaefer, who has been uh, part of the Reconnect uh, project as well as a team member for the uh, with uh, Münster University. Uh, he's a political scientist, uh, works as a consultant for citizen participation in Europe, and um, uh, one of uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, tangible parts of that, uh, I guess, is the organization called EFOC, right? Which is uh, which was part also of the organization. Uh, on the Conference on the Future of Europe, and particularly the organization uh, of the European uh, Citizens Panels. So, please take the floor. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much um, for the invitation. It feels a bit like coming home um, after having spent two years in the project and now um, yeah, assuming a new role, um, namely the practitioner's view now. Um, as, as you said, um, designer, implementer, and, and facilitator in the European Citizens Panels of the Conference on the Future of Europe, but also as assistant of the citizens in the conference plenary, which is a, um, the, the, basically the follow-up to the citizen panels, um, which is still taking place at the moment. Um, so I hope I can sketch out some of the practices that we implemented during the citizen panels, but also some of the problems and challenges that we face and, and how we dealt with that, or maybe also to derive some lessons learned for the future of, of such formats um, at the European level. Um, so let me first talk about the, the citizen panels before, before maybe I come to the, the plenary uh, at the end. So in the citizen panels, I think um, I want to make four points. Um, first, relating to the scope um, of, the, of the panels and, and the time that the citizens had in these deliberations. So as probably you know, the, um, the number of the, the topics that citizens were asked to discuss were quite large. There were um, uh, nine different topics bundled together in a bit arbitrary way. For example, there was a, a panel um, with the 200 citizens involved on stronger economy, social justice and jobs, education, culture, youth education, and digital transformation. So that already is a bit emblematic for the, um, the lack of, of focus that we had. On the one hand, it was great that people were given topics um, and that underneath these topics they could also define their own agenda a bit more to, to, to prioritize subtopics. But on the other hand, um, it, it was too big of a challenge, of course, to, to answer these very, let's say, vague questions in a, in a very um, precise way. So I think in the future um, the lesson would be that to make topics more precise, to, to scale them a bit down, um, and um, yeah, less topics and more precise. That is actually an interesting contrast to the time that citizens were given uh, to discuss these topics, um, which were only three weekends, so three sessions that we, that we did in the citizen panels. Um, and this, as you might imagine, is, is too short, of course, to really go into um, a deep level of deliberation, which just needs time. Um, it needs um, citizens who reflect on uh, their own positions. They, of course, it's not only an expression of, of own viewpoints, it's also a bit of taking into account the views of others, finding consensus. Um, so this was definitely too, too, too short time, and 
I think a formula for the future would be allow more time for deliberation, but with less topics, and, and we'll be fine. And just maybe to, to make you aware that we're, we're dealing with a multilingual context, so people also were uh, simultaneously, simultaneously interpreted when speaking, so that also created a bit of, of need for more time um, because of time lags when, when speaking to each other. Um, second point would be the citizens in general. Um, so I think the, the recruitment process, uh, the random selection that, we, that not we, but the, the recruitment agency Kantar did, worked quite well. I mean, they had to uh, select um, 800 citizens from all countries and backgrounds um, in a very short time. They did that quite, quite well, but of, in the end, of course, we were faced with a slight over-representation of highly educated citizens, as you can imagine also. Uh, those who are doing surveys will, will find the same, same problem. And also the under-representation of, of minorities um, and, um, of course, um, uh, less well-educated um, people. So this, of course, is, is a problem when it comes to the principle of inclusion that it should definitely be a main pillar of such processes. Uh, and, the, of course, the principle of, of representativity. Um, what was good, actually, was the focus on young people, so one-third of the participants were under 25 years old, <clears throat> and that definitely gave a, a plus and a, and a refresh, fresh energy to the panels. Um, of course, the young people were definitely a bit shyer than the, the older ones, but also they were much better equipped to, informal, uh, to, to form informal networks with other young people, um, mainly due to their better ability of speaking English, but also uh, the use of digital me social media. Um, so so that, that, that was definitely great that basically the whole society with the demographic reality that we have in Europe was not represented um, as such in, in the panels. Um, so third, so maybe just maybe as a lesson for the future, more focus on, on underrepresented groups is needed and, and of course that will entail uh, significant, uh, significant efforts. Um, third, the role of experts, also very important. Of, of course citizens came very um, let's say, very much with a blank page to, this, uh, to these panels. They were not well informed about the topics themselves. They couldn't choose the topics they discussed. Um, they also were not well informed about the EU, um, their institutional system. So that um, was definitely hard for them to, to grasp. Um, so the experts were key um, for, this, for this process. And some of the experts, I think, were also sitting here in the room or on, on stage even, um, that they were present in these, these sessions. Mm -hmm. Um, and they could, of course, see that citizens possess tuned in knowledge, which gave them a big role in this process. Um, however, the selection process of, of experts was, of, uh, for those who were involved, a bit opaque. Um, so I think the, what was lacking maybe was an external body, um, uh, like an advisory, scientific advisory body, that guide this, this process of ex expert selection a bit more. And also, what I think one of the main challenges was that the expert input, although it was great um, uh, academics mostly that uh, delivered fantastic inputs, uh, they were often not designed very much for, for amateur um, audiences. And um, so that is also, I think, something that we need to take <laughs> into account in the future, um, that we adapt these uh, inputs very much to the audience that, that we're speaking to. Um, and, and citizens definitely would have needed, I think, a more general introduction to the EU um, um, uh, because often until the end they had, had really problems to distinguish even the, the main institutions, for example. Um, what is actually interesting was that we implemented this, um, a system of fact-checking, that's how we called it, which basically provided um, ad hoc or on-demand um, knowledge and expert information. And that, I think, was a, was, a, was a great thing that we did, and I think we should even do, do, do more of that in the future to have less expert input at the beginning of a process, but more uh, during such a process to, to answer the questions of citizens that, that come spontaneously. Right, um, and last but not least, maybe the fourth area would be the, the, some more key challenges that we have, most specifically multilingualism. So uh, I wanted to make you aware that most of the citizens do not speak English or did not speak English in a way that they really could interact with each other on, on, on in this kind of level. Um, so we had to do simultaneous interpretation, and that worked quite well. But of course, that it also creates barriers. <laughs> People never he really hear the voice of each other um, in these sessions. Um, they always have to wait um, for the to interpreter to come through. Sometimes we work even with relay languages, so that takes actually two interpretations um, before someone is heard. Um, so that was, of course, a, a big challenge, as, as well as multilingual tools to work on text uh, in the moment, not only um, uh, time lag. There, so there, there needs to be definitely more development. We did find solutions for that, but um, 
better tools are definitely needed. And also when it comes to small talks, I think this is also a key, key problem, of course, for people who don't speak English, because these, these, these moments of interacting with each other beside the, uh, the, the sessions is, is key to build trust um, to, and to maybe also talk about the topics. Um, so that is also a problem if we don't have um, English speaking or people who speak the same language. Um, then because then they tend to bond only in, in national groups or language groups um, in the end. So multilingualism is a key to inclusion. I think that's a lesson learned. Um, it's a key challenge for these processes at the European level, um, especially when we go beyond the, the bubble of, of English-speaking highly educated groups. And lastly, for this the European citizen panels, um, what was very interesting is the multimodality. So we used um, on-site sessions, uh, it was the first session, mainly due to COVID. Then we had the second session uh, fully online. And the third session uh, was re uh, basically hybrid. Um, also as a result of COVID, because some citizens couldn't, couldn't travel. Mm. Um, so face-to-face -face events, I think, are super important to create a connection between assembly members to also solve maybe conflicts and, and to build trust and also to, to finalize in the end. But I think from the, on -sites, uh, from the online sessions, we also realized that there was little sign of, of screen fatigue. There was little sign of, of um, fatigue. So people actually were often also happy to be able to take part in this from their homes, from their familiar environments. So I think both uh, modes um, have a future. Uh, the hybrid format actually risks to create a burst of both worlds um, uh, situation, but it, I think from a longer process, we should definitely mix online and on-site events um, um, in the future. And um, if I'm not uh, interrupted, I will just uh, make a last point, I think a final point uh, on the conference plenary. And that was actually quite fascinating to see the citizens coming from the deliberations and now in the, into this fantastic innovative format of the conference plenary where they meet politicians and professional um, of politics and citizens were used to deliberate with each other to, to, have to, to solve everything in discussions and then suddenly they were shocked that a plenary debate consisted only in a series of, of scripted statements that were just read one after the other and there was no real dialogue. And citizens were really appalled by that, and, and they find it quite absurd as a debate format. And on the other hand, um, I think, for example, MEPs, for them it was normal that the actual work is done between the sessions, that they work on texts, that they find compromises in informal talks, and citizens often were not so much interested, but also didn't have the time to, to engage in that um, in the, in the, during the session, or between the sessions. So um, it, it was quite a clash of cultures, I think. Um, and it was very interesting to see how both sides um, went along with that. Um, citizens were for also appalled by a half empty hemicycle, although actually the attendance rate was probably not bad compared to <laughs> normal standards of, of, of parliamentary um, reality. Um, but they interpreted it as a sign of disrespect when people would not come to the plenary, uh, to not to the hemicycle. Um, and as a consequence of their expressing their dissatisfaction, we also implemented several measures um, to dealing with that. For example, um, giving them the, the possibility to have make more ad hoc um, interactions with blue cards that they could raise and they could just react on a speaker. And for the last session, we also, for example, make the on-site presence mandatory in the plenary for people who want to take the floor. So I think a lesson learned is uh, both sides can learn a lot from each other um, in the future. And uh, we need to break up probably some of the traditional logics of representative democracy um, um, for those fu uh, future formats and implementing um, innovations at the European level. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, there's still so much to be said, and the process is not over, as we know. Um, the conference observatory is observing. There's also the uh, European University Institute Democracy Forum, who is investigating. Uh, and so in certain ways, I suppose, these uh, new ways of doing democracy, participatory, deliberative, still need to be investigated. Um, and that's uh, what we're going to do also with the next two speakers who will reflect on the potential outcomes. There might be two important outcomes, I suppose, roughly, um, in very specific terms, a, a permanent citizen assembly, uh, and in a wider sense, perhaps, uh, um, 
uh, a form of convention. Um, and that's, I think, where, where Carlos also steps in. Carlos Closa, who's a, a part-time professor at the, uh, the School of Transnational Governance, EUI in Florence, uh, as well as professor at the Spanish National Research Council. Um, he's done uh, an extensive range of work also uh, on the prior experience, which was a bit different, I suppose, the convention on the future of Europe. Uh, and so I think that's where his remarks will uh, uh, step in. Please go ahead, Carlo. So thank you, for, thank you for the introduction, and thank you also for giving me the opportunity to address this audience. It's really a pleasure to meet uh, Reconnect partners after four years, almost, and to have this uh, opportunity to also meet some of the colleagues, like Marlene Ving, that I haven't seen in quite a few time, and it's very nice to be sitting next to, next to her. M my talk, I think, is going to be a little bit more pessimistic to the previous speakers, and it's because I'm going to address the second, the subtitle of this panel, which is The Future of Europe. And looking at the, the specific element I want to address, which is the formal procedures for advancing in the future of Europe, my diagnosis is going to be very pessimistic. And not only pessimistic, I don't find any way out of it. I have titled my, my presentation something like the democratic dilemma of treaty reform, and I want to focus on treaty reform. We have produced this very wonderful leaflet, and I must say it's, it's really good. I'm very, very impressed. We have 30 recommendations here, and I think Jan did a wonderful work in summarizing them in a very coherent way. My point is that many of these recommendations require treaty reform, and these are not the minor ones. Uh, so if we take the point of rule of law, we speak about changing unanimity in Article 7.2. This is not a minor thing. We speak about uh, elaborating on the sanctions regime under Article 7.2, sorry. That's not a minor thing. <laughs> if we go to the democratic dimension, we speak about the specific candidate process, this could be developed under a constitutional convention, although we did that in the past, but who is going to trust that with a new election in France, perhaps bringing a new leader to the European Union? I would prefer to have hard law rather than a constitutional convention. And the same if we go to the electoral field and we think about the electoral act. We can do that again with a constitutional convention, but I would prefer to have hard law. So in summary, my, my point here is that we need treaty reform for the important proposals that we are putting forward here. Now, starting from that, what can we do in terms of treaty reform? And here is where my negative point here comes. The European Union has been quite good in developing some mechanism for including citizens, and I think the Conference on the Future of Europe is a good example of that. It's a good example of democratic exper experimentalism. It's a good example of democratic innovation. I don't think it's a good example of efficiency or efficacy. Why so? Because any element coming from the conference will have to be harnessed to the formal treaty reform procedure. And the formal treaty reform procedure includes a convention. And we shouldn't really do away with the idea of the convention. The convention brings together members of the national parliaments and members of the European Parliament, hence representative democracy. I feel very uneasy with those who defend that the conference is a model of deliberate democracy via via the convention being representative democracy. Hey, parliaments were deliberative assemblies. It's not different. We have representatives to deliberate, not to do something different. Hence, I would find very difficult to try to bypass the idea of the convention. That is an interesting innovation created. Let us remember that in the, early, in the late 90s to, to the draft the, the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So the first challenge we have here, which is the minor one, is to align the proposals coming from the conference to an eventual convention. But that's the minor thing. The second thing that we have to do is perhaps to include here the role of the national governments and the inter intergovernmental conference. And we know that governments tend to bypass what is coming from citizens. I will be very doubtful, and even from conventions, I will be very doubtful that the governments will be prepared to take blank face what is coming from the conference of the future, but even from the convention. But again, I do not consider it to be the most important obstacle. What is the most important obstacle? The more important obstacle comes when you have to ratify the constitution or the treaty, call it as you want it. The problem we have here is that uh, the European Union operates under the regime of unanimity. And this regime, if you do some kind of archaeology in the way that uh, Daniel did in the morning, uh, before uh, regarding the conditionality rules, well, you could find that, that the unanimity was designed for a union of six member states. Mm -hmm. And it's a very classical rule of international public law and has been adapted without any kind of change when the union has passed from six to 27. The numbers are impressive. It's more than triple. But not only that, the rule establishes 
in what is a very important democratic element that each state can ratify the treaties according to their domestic uh, priorities. And those domestic priorities include the four national parliaments, may include also referendum, may include rulings by constitutional courts that feel that they have to defend the primacy of the national constitutions. This may imply also constitutional reform process at the same time unless other kind of mechanism and actors intervening in the process, and so on and so forth. In any case, this is a highly democratic exercise. From the point of view of a polity that's conceived as Calypso, Nicolaidis will put it as democracy, differentiated democracy that concur to ratify, to approve a constitution, a treaty under the unanimity rule. But that's one way to, to look at it. The other way to look at, uh, at this set of rules is efficacy. What we have there? I can give you the numbers. So let's go back to Lisbon Treaty. The Lisbon Treaty was ratified by 57 chambers. Yes, 57 chambers. It was subject to only one referendum because the previous constitution was clear by five referendums, two, two, two of which failed, as you may, you may remember. It was challenged by not less than four constitutional courts, and it led to one case of constitutional reform, plus a case in which the president of a certain country threatened to veto the agreement. Under unanimity, the veto player structure that the rule established is huge, and it's uncertain that any change, being this a very small change, can pass these ratification requirements. Hence, we have this dilemma. The rules are highly efficient from the point of view of democracy, but highly inefficient from the point of view of deliberating or sorry of delivering a kind of uh, outcome. And here the question, and I'm going to close my, my intervention, my very short intervention with that. How can we reconcile appealing to the to the to the title of our project? How can we reconcile democracy requirements with efficacy requirements? We cannot. We cannot. And the problem is that we are we are not really putting that reflection on the forefront of our substantive reflections. So we put our substantive reflections before the formal requirements. And in that way, we are perhaps moving away from the center of our worries, what is the important dilemma about the future of Europe. If we want to continue on with these reforms, changing the treaties, the set of rules that we have now are highly inefficient. And this is a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. I mean, one, one way of understanding your uh, argument is that we need a revolution. <laughs> but that's a, a personal interpretation. Uh, let's move to our last speaker, um, Alberto Alamano, a good friend of the Reconnect project, um, Jean, Jean Monnet, professor in European Union law at the uh, Ecole des Hautes d'Etudes Commerciales in Paris. Um, also very important, I think, to mention, um, uh, founder of the so-called Good Lobby, uh, which is a specific way, I think, of linking citizens with institutions and uh, 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 processes of litigation, for instance. He's also uh, part of the European University Institute's uh, Democracy Forum. Um, welcome, Ar Alberto, and please... Uh, thank you, thank you, Paul. Hello, everyone. It's nice to see you here again after a few, after a few years. My role in Reconnect has been quite modest. Um, I've been in the scientific advisory board, um, you know, those guys like sort of emeritus watching, overseeing, and uh, my contribution was very much limited to a couple of webinars on the state of European democracy in COVID times. So it was at, at the time when we were all confined. Well, as the Reconnect project wins down, I've been asked to share a few thoughts about the state of European participatory democracy. That's what I've been teaching at the College of Europe over the last three years. So a lot of discussions with young uh, bright minds, uh, and I've been also trying to popularize and practice um, with my little nonprofit, The Good Lobby, and trying to figure out how this conference in the future of Europe could help, help us to actually take the most out of these participatory channels, which have been there since the very beginning. If you think about the right of petition, which was already there in the European call and steel community, in the rules of procedure, how interesting it is, right? I recently brought a study looking how historically this right of petition hasn't been used, uh, never been really taken up. And there are a lot of historical reasons that might explain why the EU institutions have always been reticent to actually taking up uh, some expression of popular will. And that's basically where my research is currently focusing on. 
So let me start by saying that after 70 years of um, integrations, well, Europeans are pretty socioeconomically coming together, but the political system has not necessarily catched up. So we don't have a European political sphere, we don't necessarily have European political parties, we don't have a European media space, and this renders European action very difficult to be responsive and to be accountable, and therefore it gets contested. Hence, the attempt to move from the output legitimacy into the input legitimacy. We all remember the white paper on governance back in the year 2000, which really opened up the era in which we still are in. I don't think we haven't made huge progress uh, since that time. But we can see um, the mushrooming of participatory channels being created within the European institutions uh, since the year 2000. You can think about certainly the European citizen initiatives, but also public consultations becoming mandatory. There's no European country that has a mandatory public consultation on every single initiative. It doesn't have to be legislative, which have been kind of opening up on paper many opportunities for the average European citizens to have a say in European policymaking. This really challenges conventional understanding of what the European Union offers you as a citizen in terms of opportunity to influence the process. These participatory channels, petitions, CCIs, public consultation, refit platform, complaints to European ombudsmen remain pretty much unknown. When you look at the overall literacy of the average European citizen, they never heard about them. And there are also very little use as a result, or even misused by special interests and groups who are very much in the bubble, who take advantage of these participatory channels in order to advance their own interests. So that's basically where we are. Uh, participatory democracy exists, is in the treaty, is enshrined. I agree with your assessment. I think Pavi is saying, well, there's much more we could take out of the Lisbon Treaty uh, as it stands today. We just need to shape entirely the way in which these tools have been used, have been interpreted. There's no member of the European Parliament who wants to sit in the Petty Commission. Come on, they don't want to be there. But the Petty Commission is the only committee that allows you to get a sense of what's happening on the ground in Europe, how you can Europeanize a local problem into a private solution. But this is not the mindset. So how do we get from this 2000 moment, awakening, we need the input legitimacy to the Conference on the Future of Europe? Well, I would say the Conference on the Future of Europe is a byproduct of the lack of a complete European democratic system. Uh, we don't have this uh, transnational space for debates. We don't have a political space that allow us to have those conversations. So what do we do? We create uh, from scratch an experiment which is basically bringing together 800 people randomly selected, relying on the input coming from this platform, but also on the plenary, uh, which will be somehow processing those recommendations. So in a way, it is an experiment, the Citizens' Assembly, within an experiment, which is the Conference on the Future of Europe, which is acting within the other big experiment, which is the European Union. That's where we are. It's pretty niche, it's pretty elitist. There are exclusionary effects when you only have 800 people following the debate. Nobody is hoping that the Conference on the Future of Europe will mobilize millions of people. There was still some hope before Christmas, but it's not going to take off. And we are one week away from the moment of truth. What the plenary, mixing in an unprecedented manner, European citizens and um, the representatives make out of the 178 recommendations uh, coming out of this process. This is really the $6 million question. There's no working method defined. The only thing we know is that if the representatives that have to come with a consensus, so there should be a vast majority, they depart from the 170 recommendations, well, there should be a sort of minority opinion flagging this to the executive board. That's the only thing we know in terms of working method. All the rest has not been facilitated and I agree with your analysis. So there's a little methodological issue there. Having said though, uh, despite all these limitations, the Conference on the Future of Europe might leave, in my humble opinion, an important legacy for the future European democratic direction. As I said, this has been experimental in nature, but both the process and the outcome, the 178 recommendations, are there to stay. They cannot be neglected. They've been incredibly public in the way in which they were processed. I was in Florence as one of the experts. And to see these recommendations being live, live at the moment of publication was incredible. And as somebody who has been spending the last 20 years uh, in a pro-European environment, it was pretty refreshing and contagious to see many people who never had the chance to discuss and talk about the European Union to be empowered to express an opinion about the EU. And these people were not speaking English, they didn't have a common language, but still they were committed to engage into that process. This is 
decide the nice side. This is what we probably have to preserve out of this exercise. The EU has never managed to be as inclusive as in this little experiment, but to what extent this experiment will be institutionalized to the point of making it happen within the current institutional architecture? And I think this is the question. And methodologically, the challenge has always been for any participatory channel, think about ECIs, how do you integrate the participatory input into the representative day-to-day -day democracy? And this is the same challenge uh, countries are facing in France after the climate convention, after the Grand Débat. Same challenge we face also in Ireland, where a referendum then led the citizens' output into uh, the overall democratic conversation. How do we make this happen? And we see already in the plenary, I think you witnessed this uh, directly, uh, Constantine, these competing claims of legitimacy and representation. On the one hand, you have the politicians saying, I've been elected. On the other hand, you have citizens randomly selected saying, well, I'm much more represented than you are because we are more different and diverse. How do you ca can actually make sense of this tension? W we don't know. We're going to see this in the coming weeks. But certainly, uh, for the time being, uh, we could see both the ideas and the process to stay with us. So I've been often referring to this metaphor of the genie lamp. You know, all these ideas will be out there they will be used in the next European Parliament elections when it comes to institutional reforms, when it comes to moving or shifting to unanimity vote in many more policy issues, when it comes to sharing much more information and making more intelligible uh, European policy and European functioning. All these ideas, it won't be impossible to neglect or to sidestep for any political party and for any institution. This probably will be one of the major legacy to somehow uh, highlight that certain taboos, certain issues nobody wants to take care or take a position on in the same way as the same-sex marriage or the right of abortion was in Ireland will become part of the political conversation. So we are opening the Overton window in a way which is unprecedented for the European level. Will all of this translate into institutional reform? I don't think so. And I don't think that the success of the Conference of the Future of Europe should be actually measured against its ability to lead automatically to an Article 48 um, opening, also because of the reason uh, mentioned by Carlos, not necessarily fit for purpose, but as you might remember, after the shock of the referendum on the mini, which have led to the mini uh, treaties, to the Lisbon Treaty, to the mini convention, constitutional convention, the process that was used at the time, the convention, was then institutionalized into mm -hmm. Article 48. So don't you think that now we see history repeating itself? I think so. I think we're going to be seeing some changes in the way in which we do treaty making in Europe. We're going to be seeing an opening to the citizens' input. And already now the discussion is, should we allow citizens to be part of that next phase after the Conference on the Future of Europe? In other words, we've been creating an extra step before the preparatory step to the opening of institutional reform. It will be a process. It's going to be a journey. It's not going to be something automatic, and I remind you a bit the timeline before closing. Next weekend, we have the final plenary, uh, mixing um, all these political leaders, 108 from the members of the European Parliament, 108 from the national parliaments, and then uh, we also have, of course, the commission. We have the citizens' ambassadors representing different panels, and they will need to kind of deliberate uh, on a proposal. It's just a proposal. So on Sunday, if you're lucky, we're going to go out with a proposal and we're going to be seeing how many of the 178 recommendations are there, and how many of them actually entail potentially a treaty reform. And we saw from an empirical study I recently run that approximately one, 21 out of 178 do entail treaty reform. Most of them, approximately 120, can actually be done under the Lisbon Treaty. So if you take one recommendation after the other, and you analyze them, you could see that a lot of what citizens are asking could be done by the EU or the member states in a coordinated fashion. Will they do so? Will this lead to a reopening of the policy priorities of the von der Leyen Commission? These are open questions. This is basically the political engagement that it was taken at the time. Final point, I think we're going to be seeing, and this is my prediction for the midterm, a mushrooming of competing models for permanent citizens' assembly, meaning how do we institutionalize citizens' involvement in the day-to-day -day institutional architecture of the EU? There are European political parties who have been preparing these models. There are some foundations that are working and promoting uh, this. 
There are some academics developing these models, so I think we should play the game. We should try to get the most out of this opportunity to refresh, rejuvenate the European uh, institutional decision-making by potentially making sure the missing stakeholder, meaning the citizen, will have something to say. It's a very balancing act. <clears throat> it's not something we should buy um, you know, acritically. Uh, it is something we need to spend time on and having informed conversations in order to make sure which is the right way in a transnational uh, democracy to have participatory input coming in. In my next few months, I will be working on this. Uh, AFCO, so one of the parliamentary committee, asked me to do some thinking about this. So I will also be doing this kind of meta study, looking at all what the other people are saying about the model and trying to figure out what could be the, the meta model that the parliament will put forward. But the commission is already putting forward its own model. So we're going to be see a multiplication of meta studies that will enrich this debate and potentially come up with some different ways of doing treaty making reform and also day to day decision making. I think there are interesting times. I'm, I'm quite happy. Thank you so much, uh, Alberto. Um, this ends our, our tour de force in a way, but of course we'll now have uh, time to debate uh, uh, a Q&A session. By the way, one thing that strikes me always that citizens become then defined as the citizen or the average citizen, which is something uh, to think about. Um, but let's open the floor. Um, we've had many different interventions, um, and as great room for reflection also I think in relation to the 30 recommendations that Reconnect came up with. Um, so I wonder who wants to... There's a deafening sign. Go, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, panel and uh, for the debate that we were able to follow. Um, two questions and whoever wants to answer them. Uh, the first is a bit provocative. Um, Alemano, um, uh, you, basically, I think what what has what what you said, Alberto, is basically uh, that, that we can await a proposal, uh, that there will be a proposal potentially coming out of it. I, my next question is, um, to which degree will this proposal carry legitimacy, mm. and to which degree will this proposal carry more? and now I get provocative, uh, more legitimacy um, than a proposal coming out of a simulation game of a very diverse group of students. Um, and I'm, I'm just putting it out like this. The second question is to all of you, to which degree is actually our exercise here an exercise to understand a growing gap between uh, an expectation, an ever-growing, more greater expectation of the EU to do something for European citizens, potentially also growing democratically, but at the same time having the problem of not only delivering capabilities, you know the old gap between expectation and capability, but also actually credibility. To which degree are we losing credibility by actually creating again and again institutional mechanisms that in the end, and I'm coming back to what Carlos said, cannot really work because they have to go through a bottleneck. And um, I would be very happy to hear your comments. Thank you so much. I think we might want to collect a number of questions if there are any. Okay. Thank you. Picking up actually on Paul's concluding comment, to what extent are the 178 recommendations that are coming from the citizens, actually, do they fit with the thinking of those of us who've actually sat in our ivory towers and come up with 30 recommendations? So is there a sweet spot where we could see that there are ways in which we could put forward proposals that might really resonate with the citizens, or does it look at the moment as if we're completely off track? Hi there, thanks so much for the different presentations. Um, 
I'm trying to link in a way the, the sense of, of populism, popular resentment, your skepticism, to these new forms. And what strikes me is that you would expect, if you ask citizens to talk about Europe, many would be grumpy mm -hmm. and negative. Um, that's not what I hear being resonated here. What happened? Uh, of course, we like to say, they're better informed and enlightened, and when they discuss, then they should, it turns out that Europe is great. <laughs> or they, did we somehow lose the, 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 the citizens that we should be speaking to most in the process? Okay, maybe we could try for a first round of uh, responses. Um, it's a bit difficult, but it was, there wasn't any direct uh, uh, interpolation, but um, anyone wants to react to what has been... Well, very briefly to the first question, since it was directed to, to me, and thanks a lot for, for asking. Um, the, 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 the essence of your question is whether the proposal coming from the plenary which might entail treaty change will be more legitimate than a proposal coming from the average institution or the average, members, average member state under Article 48 procedure. And my answer would be yes, it will carry more legitimacy because of the way in which the process has been shaped, because of the way in which the citizens involved into the process were not the usual suspects, but they were people we have been proactively looking for having into the room, which might not necessarily be as representative as we would like of society. We know that minority group, vulnerable groups were not there, so there was also self-selection. But still, those groups, and we all lived them, we all went, we were exposed to the Conference of Europe, Future of Europe, were significantly much more representative and diverse than the average people engaging with the European institution. And this carries value. It's a matter, it's an empirical matter to know how representative they are, how different they are from the average European citizen engaging with the European Union, but certainly they are. Of course, there's been a filtering process because that's what the plenary process is about, meaning that we will see by Sunday what kind of recommendations have been retained. And I'm linking to the, your question, which is really about the nature of the proposal. You can see a variety of groups, but the most interesting proposal, they are basically pushing towards further integration, but not because you have a bunch of federalists which have been selected randomly, but simply because those citizens and also I tackle Ben's question, have been put in the conditions to have a proper conversation about Europe, but nobody was pushing them to say you should have more Europe. There are proposals actually asking for denationalizing uh, certain competencies. There are very few, but most of them are asking to be entitled to understand a bit more about who is taking decisions in Europe, at what level and why. And you don't have to be a federalist to ask for, you know, some basic literacy about how government work at the let's say, European, national, and local level. This is the feeling I've been, I've been grasping, and I really think that this will inevitably stay with us for, for a longer time. And this is the kind of acceleration that I expect to happen because of the conference in the long term. Sure. Thank you very much. And to all the presenters also for their very uh, thought-provoking presentations. And to your question as uh, does it make sense to create yet another institutional mechanism and will that do the job? And my sense is indeed that we need to get out of the Brussels bubble and we need to take the European institutions more to the member states, to the countries, um, and that I feel is more likely to have a positive outcome in terms of popular sentiment vis-a-vis -vis the EU than maybe creating yet another mechanism or another body. But I wouldn't share your negativity in terms of the European Union because I do believe that a vast number of people uh, believe in the European project. Uh, we, see it, uh, uh, we see it in the, the response of the European Union towards Ukraine. Uh, but we've, we've also seen, uh, confronted with COVID-19, how the European Union has stepped up and, and now created uh, HERA, uh, the health uh, agency when this was not even a European competency, an EU competency to begin with. So, I, and I think people do see that and value that. Um, I was also looking recently at the Eurobarometer statistics, and it shows that actually values and human rights rank in the top three of what people, European citizens care about. So I, th I, I wouldn't yet be into doom thinking, uh, but uh, keep a, a positive note. <laughs> 
Thanks so much. We need that <laughs> in these times, a positive note. <clears throat> um, yes, two, two more anecdotes I would like to share that respond to the questions, I think, um, at least a bit. So to, to Ben's, uh, there's a, a kind of infamous now, a member of the plenary called Mr. Beck from the AFD, who is uh, always um, standing up and complains about the whole process and really tries to discredit it. Um, I think in the last plenary it was where he signed up and said to the citizens, basically, you are all just a pro-EU bubble and basically you were um, not randomly selected, actually. And so, interestingly, and I think he has a point in the way that political attitudes and orientations were not an issue at the selection <coughs> and the selection process, but several citizens then stood up and were um, totally enraged because they, they felt, actually, they said, they said, we are your skeptic. We, I am very your skeptic, they said. Um, but I, I care... That why I'm, that's why I'm here, actually. So I want to make Europe better. So actually, there's, we, I, th I think we heard a lot of what you would call Eurosceptic views um, targeted at that the current EU is not fulfilling people's uh, desires and wishes. And, and that's why they were engaged in the process. And I found quite revealing also to myself because I, I had similar questions, actually. Um, and then maybe to, to, to I didn't do an, uh, an analysis of the recommendations of citizens with the rec Reconnect recommendations, but I heard yesterday, I think, in a discussion that they were quite um, similar, partly, and I had the pleasure to facilitate a discussion on unanimity uh, with the citizen subgroup, and I found this discussion was super intense and controversial, and they were all sides of the, of the discussion, so there were people very much in favor of national vetoes and, and some who were on the opposite. And interestingly, the, <clears throat> the, the only consensus at the end was that they agreed to put in a, a recommendation saying we want to discuss the role of unanimity <laughs> in um, decision making. And basically that's very similar to the, rec the recommendation of the Reconnect project. So it's quite interesting actually to see the similarities. Do you have, do you have uh, Julia first? I okay, I didn't see that. Thank you. Please go ahead. Um, I really enjoyed your second question uh, on whether we are losing credibility by creating mechanisms that simply cannot deliver. I think that this was one of the main concerns when the Conference on the Future of Europe started, uh, because we thought that we were telling citizens that the Conference on the Future of Europe we would actually give them a voice, uh, that the proposals that they would make through the digital platform or through the um, citizens' panels would actually become uh, adopted proposals at the European Union level. And us following the conference from the very beginning would, were very concerned about this because we knew that this wouldn't happen and the actual effect of uh, delivering these promises could be counterproductive because citizens would at the end of the day be deceived by the outcome of the process and think that they would have been sold, uh, sold a sort of like um, participative illusion in a way. Um, we were lucky because uh, this didn't happen. Uh, citizens did not become ever inspired or convinced by this promise that we made at the beginning. So they weren't able to be deceived because they never really thought that this was going to happen. But we are not going to be that lucky all the time. And if we expect uh, these uh, participatory mechanisms to continue happening in the future, we have to learn how to manage expectations. I think that that's what we should focus on uh, in the future, uh, to not tell citizens that their recommendations will become, um, you know, legislative initiatives in the future, but rather that they will be invited to discuss uh, issues that matter to them and that their opinions, their visions will be taken into account and potentially inform uh, decisions making by uh, policymakers, because at the end of the day, they don't have uh, that kind of legitimacy to make the decisions their own. That's my, my view on the matter. Excellent. It was, by the way, also interesting, I think, two plenaries ago to see one of the ambassadors stand up, read a statement, and said, I want <laughs> responses from politics, so a really um, um, important activist uh, attitude. Um, Carlos. Thank you. So I, I think I'm going to take the most uh, skeptical and pessimistic view of the argument as, as useful, right? So, and I see with those who think that there are significant questions about the legitimacy of this conference. It goes beyond a purely uh, exercise of uh, deliberation and debate. Any politician, uh, not even every skeptic, but any representative politician electing any member state would challenge the validity of such an uh, environment to produce any meaningful outcome. Uh, so one has referred to representative value of this conference, but representation here is measured in terms of mirroring social and economic and political composition, but we shouldn't forget that our theory of representation is based on mandates. 
even though they are not private law mandates, they are public law mandates, they are wide and interpretable by the, those elected, but nevertheless are mandates. You select people you repre to, represent them, you, to represent you because they have a mandate, they have an area in which they have, they have to act. <coughs> and what simplifies those mandates, and is something what we know in, in complex uh, democracies, are political parties. That's the mechanism that intermediates between the citizens and the decision making. We don't have that in the European Union, there are defense there, but still the European Parliament works along these lines. Now, the conference cannot claim any of those elements as part of this legitimacy. Hence, I would say that any actor operating outside this framework will challenge deeply the legitimacy of the exercise if it wants to go beyond a debate, a deliberation model. And uh, for the second question about institutionalization, which has been mentioned, I doubt it. The convention was institutionalized because there was a treaty reform that included the convention. Otherwise, we will be left in the hands of national governments. And I pretty much doubt that nowadays there will be some kind of convention that was not established by the treaties. Uh, of course, it's contrafactual, but uh, perhaps those of you who are acquainted with the traditional constitution making in the European Union will agree with my assessment that that will be very difficult nowadays if we didn't have the provision in the treaties. So, sorry for this very skeptical and pessimistic overview. Any um, further Final remarks, we are in the closing um, minutes. Um, one thing I think that should be stressed, though, is that um, this is a kind of descriptive representativeness, right, of the conference, uh, but it all ties into how you link it to decision-making. I mean, if you read the conference on the future of Europe rather as a deliberative exercise that would need to make society deliberate, and so to activate the liberative process all over Europe, uh, that would be a different story, I think. It, and that it hasn't delivered, I think. I mean, there we could be very critical. I mean, hardly anyone in Europe knows about this exercise, and that's a, that's, that's a shame, I think, uh, that might need um, to be addressed. I think we <laughs> might as well close the session. And, uh, thank you so much to all the speakers and uh, to the people who asked questions, and um, we'll proceed the, uh, the conference to the final uh, 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 intervention. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are almost at the end, but we haven't had the best part yet that is now to come. It is my great honor to introduce our closing keynote speaker, Herman Count van Rompuy. But how do you introduce somebody who doesn't need an introduction? It is an immense honor for us to have the honorary president of the European Council with us today to close the final day of our final conference and of the Reconnect project as a whole. Herman van Rompuy has had a very impressive career in both Belgian and European politics, gaining experience in topics that are at the heart of the Reconnect project for over 40 years. Let me just recall a couple of things. After having been inter alia president of the Flemish Christian Democrats, budget minister, deputy prime minister, Speaker of the House of Representatives of Belgium. He was from the end of December 2008 to November 2009 Prime Minister of this country. And then he became the first full time president of the European Council from the 1st of December 2009, the day which we all teach our students was the day of the entry into force of the Treaty of Lisbon until the 30th of November 2014. Since then, he has been doing still many, many things, including uh, being president of the European Policy Center, a think tank dedicated to fostering European integration. He has also recently chaired the high-level group on democracy established by the Committee of the Regions, which recently adopted its final report on strengthening European democracy and he's still combining all of these um, very important tasks with being a professor at multiple universities, including at KU Leuven, where he is also a honorary doctor. 
throughout his rich career, Hermann van Rompuy has been, so to say, the embodiment of European values, which also resulted in him winning the very prestigious international Charlemagne Prize of Aachen, which is the most prestigious prize for work done in the service of European unification. And you may all remember that, together with the presidents of the European Commission and of the European Parliament, he received, on behalf of the European Union, the Nobel Peace Prize for the EU in 2012. I have here with me <clears throat> a copy of a book that we published at the end of another European project. It's called the European Union and Human Rights. And Honorary President Van Rompuy wrote a foreword to that book. And let me say just something from that foreword which really struck me when I took a look at, at it again. Because he says, the Union's safe bet, safest bet to avoid a return to war is to use values as a counterpoint to the blind pursuit of self-interest. That was very forward-looking and even more topical today than when Honorary President Van Rompuy wrote those uh, wise words. We are incredibly grateful for his time and I will now uh, kindly give the floor to Professor Van Rompuy for his reflections regarding a more resilient Europe through respect for fundamental values. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor Wouters, dear Jan, I have to be flattered once a day, and you did the job this evening. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. So I will not approach the team I have been assigned from a, a legal perspective. You are an expert. But from the perspective of a political thinker and a former practitioner. We live in a time of paradoxes, also concerning the foundations, the very foundations on which our societies are established. On the one hand, individual freedom is being used in an unprecedented way through social media and through personal behavior in all areas of private and public life. Freedom means happiness, freiheit, blijheid. Everything is possible and everything is allowed. I'm quoting. On the other hand, one-fifth of our citizens say they have lost faith in democracy, the guarantee of all those freedoms. Look at what happened in Washington on the 6th of January 2021. That did not deter many Americans enough to turn against their so-called leader. Sometimes one-third of the voters, sometimes almost half of the voters, vote for parties that they know will not miss an opportunity to restrict the political freedoms of others and to turn the independent judiciary into a partisan one. Most of the time, many voters are hardly aware of the program they support. But once in power, the damage is done. Le mal est fait. Sometimes it is irreparable. Sometimes populists quickly fall through the ice when they have to tackle concrete problems in our world in perma crisis since 2008. A second paradox is that we have over democracy and under democracy at the same time. On the one hand, we see a fragmentation of the political landscape because the individualization in society leads to great volatility in voting behavior. Small parties then have to constantly please the voters that are left to them in order to remain popular. Parties also disappear, and those that do stay don't want to suffer that fate and therefore don't take too many risks. When it is established that governing is difficult with so many parties in government, 
The reproach is heard that no decisive action is taken and the major problems are insufficiently addressed. First, there was a democratic deficit, and then there is a leadership deficit. On the one hand, it is said that the voice of the people, vox populi, is not listened to enough by a mosaic of parties. And on the other hand, the same citizens do not want a leadership deficit. They want results. The dilemma I outlined of too little democracy and too little leadership is broken, so to speak, by voting for anti-establishment parties that give the impression of having a clear program and that pass the blame on the others, migrants, Europe, the establishment, etc. Social media do not only reinforce these tendencies, they also create them. They are a perturb perturbing factor in the functioning of our democracies. They contribute greatly to a feeling of powerlessness and negativity. In a research report published at the beginning of this year by the Research Institute of the Dutch Ministry of Justice and Security, experts predict that in approximately six years' time, more than 90% of all digital content will be partly or fully manipulated. In such a case, it will become increasingly difficult for citizens, journalists, and judges to verify what is real and what is fake. Those who no longer know what truth and lie are will lose trust, and trust is the basis of all coexistence. The crisis of modern politics, the crisis of democracy, refers to equally large problems in society itself. The great changes, digital and global, destabilize many and make many afraid about their future. Anchors are also missed on the personal, family, and spiritual level. What is my place? and that of my children in a world in unprecedented change. Today, in the post-COVID era, there is talk of a return to normal. What, but what is still normal? The succession of crises since 2008, from the banks to the current war, war, can imagine. And in the, in the meantime, uh, and in the meantime, uh, climate disasters further increase this feeling of insecurity. Many citizens demand more protection, more protection against the threats of our time, and do not always seek it from the parties that traditionally embody stability, but from newcomers on the political market, including adventurers and charlatans. These big shocks also create new inequalities, although less so in the countries with the Rhineland model. The gap between the higher and the lower educated also explains many recent developments. Think of Brexit and Trump. But protecting people better against unemployment, precarious jobs, climate change, terrorism, corruption, illegal migration, military invasion, Pandemics is a task for all governments at all levels of power. In short, nothing is certain. What will France do on the 24th of April? And if it votes for one or the, or the other, will the president have a majority in parliament? Perhaps even not. But the bigger question is, what is the future of democracy and of our freedoms? And the Conference on the Future of Europe is actually about the future of democracy. The two are closely linked. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, the, the EU is a unique construction that arose in reaction to the lessons of two world wars. It is based on core values like liberal democracy, the rule of law, and the social market economy. Its governance structure is defined 
by democracy being exercised in two ways. All the member states are functioning democracies based on parliamentary majorities, and at the EU, EU level, transnational democracy is expressed by a system of checks and balances via the European Parliament, the European Commission, and the Council, catering for the dual nature of the EU, EU and union of states and the union of citizens. The union is neither an international organization nor a nation state. And but despite this dual democracy, many citizens have the perception that the EU has a so-called democratic deficit. There clearly is dissatisfaction with the way European democracy functions in practice. But European democracy is not the only one under pressure. All democracies are challenged from within. European democracy is about the democracy of the EU as such and about democracy in the member states. So there is an off and an in. It is about the input, how decisions are made, how people organized and non-organized are involved, and it's about output, what is the result of policies on jobs, living standards, climate, security, migration, inequalities. In the Union in general, according to numerous surveys, there is an increasingly large group of people who no longer believe in democracy as a value, in itself participation of all in the common good, also because there is insufficient added value, results, output of the policies in areas that are very close to the hearts and minds, to, to the daily concerns and fears of people. More than ever, a strong civil society is needed to form a counterforce against fragmentation and individualization. More than ever, reliable public institutions are needed to strengthen trust in politics and politicians. More than ever, the truth needs a chance to stand against the lie. More than ever, there is a need for fairness and social cohesion recognizing that the pandemic and other crises are affecting people so differently. National and European legislation must better protect against this divide and promote our way of life and social cohesion so that no person and no place is left behind. Another reason to be very concerned, it is particularly sad that European institutions have to take action to secure the rule of law and minority rights in some member states. An absolute majority in a parliament does not mean that one may have absolute power. The Commission and the Council now have new instruments to enforce to some extent the application of the normal functioning of the rule of law and of political freedoms. The European Parliament is watching this very actively. The war, the current war, has shown that the EU shares the fear of Russia of a number of countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Hopefully, they now better understand our concerns about democracy inside the Union. We are in solidarity with Poland, but we must stand together in solidarity behind the treaties. And by the way, the war shows how the Union has totally different views on sovereignty and democracy than Russia. In a way, it's a clash of civilizations, but not in the way Huntington taught. Sometimes it is presented as if the world is now about a struggle between democracies and authoritarian regimes. That is the case only to a certain extent. Russia and China have never been democracies. And today the Western camp cannot count on the support of major democracies such as those of India and Indonesia, which is a pity. Democracy, ladies and gentlemen, must once again, and I'm speaking again about Europe, once again become a conversation. A conversation in which people listen to each other, in which there is a concern for the common good, in which moderation 
I like that word, moderation and respect prevail. This dialogue, this conversation must take place between citizens and elected politicians, between citizens themselves and between local, regional, national and European authorities. We must educate for democracy, better inform on policies. Input must go hand in hand with output. Decisions will be taken after the democratic conversation. This is how leaders should lead. But then they must also lead. There shouldn't be a leadership deficit. The problem of EU democracy is, of course, a consequence both of its size, resulting in a lack of proximity, and of its diversity, resulting in a lack of the sense of belonging. Within a demos, its members are willing to exhibit a higher level of solidarity and trust. That's very human. However, with increased business and work commuting, a common currency, tourism, cultural exchanges, Erasmus schemes, and even continental sport events, a European identity is slowly, slowly emerging. Distances are getting smaller and we are getting to know each other better. However, this process cannot be rushed. The younger generation who grew up in a more open and more mobile Europe makes us hopeful for the future ahead. The strengthening of European democracy at large must come from the bottom up through a greater democratic empowerment of citizens and through local and regional elected representatives in whom many citizens have greater confidence than in other political representatives. Moreover, local and regional politicians constitute a group of over one million elected people, one million, who can bridge the distance in an organic way and improve proximity both between the people and Brussels as well as among the peoples of Europe. That conversation with citizens should be held regularly, especially about the strategic political agenda, what are the real priorities for many people, question mark, and about the implementation of this agenda. Much can be done within the current treaties to strengthen and deepen the EU and democracy. A crucial element in democratic renewal is a strengthening of participatory or deliberative democracy as a complement to representative democracy, which is and remains at the heart of our political system. We need to learn to converse again. And the techniques used in the Conference of the Future of Europe, the citizens' panels and digital platforms can also be used elsewhere. Representative democracy, which is the ultimate decision maker, must also be strengthened at all levels of power, and certainly at the European level, by higher participation in elections, certainly of young people, by stronger European parties through effective decision-making procedures, such as the more frequent use of qualified majority voting provided in the treaties, through innovative ideas such as transnational lists and so on. Multi-level governments also contribute to a sense of belonging. Of course, the EU respects the internal constitutional organization of countries, but it can itself set an example of better cooperation with national and other parliaments and councils. In this way, the EU can better assess the impact of certain measures in order to achieve better results. And results add its value. Results are absolutely key in uh, strengthening uh, the trust in our democracies. Many challenges of our time require a strengthening of the European, of the European level, but always in connection with the other levels of power. It had nothing to do with Euroscepticism or Euronegativism. It's just inevitable. Many challenges of our time require strengthening of the European level. And in today's geopolitical struggle and the globalization of many problems, such as climate change, there is no place for taboos, 
and clinging to the concepts of the past. Ladies and gentlemen, the war gives the impression that time runs backwards. I recall the famous book of Stefan Zweig, Die Welt von Gestern, The World of Yesterday. We must make sure that yesterday's world does not return. Thank you so much. Dear President and Professor Van Rompuy, we are immensely grateful for sharing these wise words with us. They will resonate very long in our hearts and in our minds. And personally, I just wish there were still political leaders like you around today. But now, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, students, friends, and now, by now, I count that they're only friends and no foes of Reconnect. <clears throat> it brings me to my concluding words. Reconnect comes to its conclusion now. And rather than boring you with yet another summary of an immensely rich day, I would like to conclude with a variation on a famous song of Lennon and McCarthy. We hope you have enjoyed the show. We're sorry, but it's time to go. We'd like to thank you once again. With Reconnect, we now have reached the end. Thank you very much. And for now, I can say a warm welcome to our reception in the lounge of this beautiful Fondation Universitaire. Thank you very much. Applause